All right, y'all, welcome back to another Lawns Across America podcast. Here we are, July 18th. We are moving through the summer. I hope your lawn is hanging in there. Been some interesting weather across the north, the northeast, the Midwest, and then down here in the south, especially in South Florida. Well, I should say that west coast of Florida, where we have been unseasonably dry, just got some rain today. I know that the Northeast, you guys are getting a lot of rain. I know across my friends in the Midwest, I talked to my friend Luke over in Northwest Indiana by there, and they've been having some rain as well. But I think from what I'm hearing from you guys up through like New Jersey in that area, you guys are having unseasonably, unseasonable amounts of rain. And uh, there's, there's always good and bad that goes with that, right? I used to say this when I worked for True Green too, that our, or I, I didn't say this, I was taught this and then began to repeat it. And it was true is that the weather is really going to dictate how good of a year that you have. Interestingly enough, when I did work for True Green, we would have to go in front of the CEO once a year. I don't know what they called it, but all the general managers, we would all grab our one suit that we had in our closet that we hoped fit because we hadn't, we'd hadn't. we been to a funeral recently and, and it fit pretty well. It's that same suit. You wear it to weddings, funerals, and at True Green as a general manager, you would wear that suit in front of the CEO. They had a name for it too. This guy was... Uh, I can't remember his name or anything, but he was super buttoned up, came in. You know, when I first joined True Green, the the CEO presidents, they were guys that were True Green guys that had worked their way up from spraying lawns. Don Carnes, uh, what a guy. But he was a, a rougher dude, like good businessman, good executive, but he was a rougher dude. This other guy that came in, he wasn't a long guy at all. He was just a, he was just a business guy, and he was super polished and uh, made us wear those suits for this dress down. Pretty interesting. Uh, he's also the one that changed the name of the branch manager to general manager, which I didn't understand at the time. I didn't really care until the office came out. And then I realized that branch managers, <laughs> Michael Scott was a branch manager. So I was so glad they changed the name to general manager. I guess I should give a shout out to any of you that are general managers at True Green or one of the other big lawn care companies out there. To me, that is the ultimate job to hold within one of those organizations. You end up having um, autonomy as well as a lot of responsibility and a lot of respect. Because like for me, I was the general manager of the Hickory Hills, Illinois branch over there off of Roberts Road over by there. And, uh, and so that, that facility, uh, we did close to $10 million. I think I've said 12 million in the past, but that was actually the Crestwood branch where I was just the, the marketing manager. But the, the Hickory Hills branch, when I was a general manager, the general manager is basically in charge of the whole office, right? You, I mean, I had, I think, 60 employees. That's, you know, 30 uh, lawn and hort specialists, as well as their managers. You know, you got uh, all the customer service people in there, AR and collections. And then we had a full sales department, and we would ramp that up to sometimes 30 reps in the end season. But I think we had maybe like 15 that were kind of year round. So you're in charge of a pretty big organization of all different personality types, people doing different jobs. You have people doing labor jobs. You have people doing sales jobs. You have the, uh, as, as any of you know, that work in any kind of company, that there's always this, this not always, but a lot of times there's friction between sales and operations, right? Because operations wants to do things a certain way and sales doesn't sell it right. Or sales will say, uh, we missed a sale because operations didn't do something right. There's always that back and forth. And that was very good for me to learn how to manage that, especially because when I had that position of general manager, I was, let's see, 34 or 35 years old. And most of the men uh, that worked for me and women were older. Um, our office manager, I think she was in her 40s. Uh, definitely the guys in the back were in their high 40s or 50s. My sales manager, Mike Chucci, shout out, still works for Trigger, and he was younger than me. He was one of my guys that I got to work with up through the ranks. Um, so anyway, just interesting, but uh, good old True Green days. How did I get on that? What was I talking about? <laughs> I have to rewind this. I went on a tangent there, but it was fun going down memory lane. Anyway, uh, you got to realize $10 million, 35 years old, 60 employees, um, that's a big responsibility. I think I did pretty well. I was only a general manager for a year before they promoted me to region commercial sales manager. Uh, I don't know if that was good or bad. I don't know if that was Sean. Sean was my boss. I don't know if that was the way of him telling me, bro, you ain't cut out to be a general manager or what, or he was just playing chess, which was more like what I think he was doing, moving the pieces around. And, uh, I was not one of his pawns. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was a that was a really good job. We did hit budget the one year, so I got a nice bonus 
And uh, so that was nice. But sometimes when you're only a general manager for one year, you're really kind of picking up the momentum from the guy that was before you. And the guy that before me, his name was Mike. He was a very good general manager. He got promoted to a bigger branch, so I took over his branch. And I really did. He had things running really, really well. Uh, Not saying I didn't make positive changes. I did. Our commercial sales went way up when I was there because I was in sales. And so and me and my commercial rep were tight, and we closed a lot of big commercial sales. So we did, we gained revenue, but as far as the way that the business ran and how smooth it was, that's because Mike and the management team that were there previous to me, the management team I took over, they had things running really well. So uh, I got to reap that benefit of getting that bonus that one year by just uh, basically not wrecking the ship, (laughs) just steering it with the fingertips, you know? Anyway, so back to it, what I realized was that at True Green, when we would go in front of the CEO, or really when you're giving any kind of business report, that when the weather had been bad and you're reporting on numbers that were gained or lost during a poor period of weather, so for example, a very, very late winter um, or uh, a very dry, droughty summer, and if the numbers were poor and you could line that up with bad weather, you'd always blame the bad weather. You know, so we had uh, we had a tough summer. It was just record drought conditions. I know you've seen it coming out over by there, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, the CEO, you'd hope he'd give you a little nod. Yeah, I know you guys had a drought up here, whatever. The problem is when you have, I think we had 16 branches in the region. So when you have 16 guys going up giving that same line, he gets tired of hearing it, you know. Uh, and I was the last guy cause I was the youngest, so I couldn't, uh, <laughs> I couldn't use that line, but you blame the weather. But then when the weather was good, you never gave credit to the weather. You gave credit to your people or whatever decisions you made. But then sometimes the weather would be too good and there'd be years where we'd have too much rain. And I actually dreaded the years of too much rain worse than the dry. And that is, is because people understand when you have a drought and you can, and they see it on the news they understand that their lawn is going to be brown if they're not watering. And in one case, I don't know what year it is. I have a video on my channel where I drove around in Illinois with one of my commercial reps, and we were taking pictures of lawns that were droughted out. I can't remember what year that was. 2000, maybe 8, 9, 2008. Anyway, people understand that, right? They understand I don't have an irrigation system. My irrigation system is broken, whatever, whatever. I'm not watering. It's brown. Most people understand that. However, the opposite is not true. When there's rain, unseasonable unseasonable amounts of rain in the middle of the summer and the lawns, what happens is they they get this weird mush, mush yellow look to them. Um, people can't understand that necessarily. And a lot of times it's different things Um, because they assume a lot of water means everything's good, but too much water is bad. Wet feet, you know, any grass that sits in water, it's just going to die, right? And when you have a lot of hot temperatures, high humidity, and you have a lot of rain, obviously now you're going to have a lawn that's wet a lot longer. This is going to allow disease to get worse or to spread. The water will move the disease around. Um, And then again, plants that are in have too much water with a lot of heat coupled with a lot of humidity, grass plants in the summer when they really want, and I'm talking about cool season lawns mostly, because you guys know I go by those growth humps, cool season lawns in the summer when it's hot, they don't want to grow fast. Even if you keep them watered properly, they still don't want to grow fast. You just, you know that in the summer, if your green lawn is green in a normal summer where you're watering, get a little bit of rain here and there back and forth. One of those perfect years that we never get, you know, you're not watering, but, or uh, mowing, but every week, whereas in the spring, you're mowing every three to four days with cool season grass. Well, in the summer, even if you do give the lawn a lot of water, it doesn't mean that it's going to want to grow any faster. It just doesn't. It's its natural cycle is to say, yo, it's summer. I'm chilling. Thanks for the rain. I appreciate that. I'm not going to go totally dormant on you, but I'm also not going to grow really fast. Well, then you have too much water, too much humidity, too much heat, and the grass is like drunk in the middle of the summer. It's like heat drunk, like swimming in a in a like you guys ever come down here and go in the Gulf of Mexico in August and, and it's, and it's actually like bath water. It's a little bit unnerving to be honest with you. <laughs> um, it's cause it's super shallow here. That's why we have flats. So I think there was actually record water temp down in uh, South of the Everglades actually last week. Um, the grass thinks the same thing. The grass is like, this is weird, man. I'm sitting in this warm water. Like, did somebody pee in this lawn? Like, am I sitting in, you know what I mean? Like, like the warm spot you come across in the pool. That's how your lawn feels like, whoa, what's going on? Anyway, so the disease can be there. It can get worse. Um, But also, again, you're going to see yellowing grass, grass that's just sitting in too much heat, too much humidity, too much water for a week or so or or a few days, um, which I believe you guys have had. It's going to get yellow. It's just going to do that. It's just going to be like, ugh. Um, And so 
how do you, how do you deal with that? Well, that's where the weather is winning. And you, you, you think that, wow, it's great that I have all this rain, but there's actually a bad part to that or a, or a, a negative. And that's the whole give and take of lawn care. That's why it's so challenging because even as much as you learn or as many your land and you understand what's going to happen in this corner and this part of the lawn and how I treat this and that and the shade patterns and how the shade of the lawn changes over the years, the direction that the sun changes, you learn all of these different things and you get better at making applications. You get better at predicting what's going to happen. You can get ahead of things. Uh, maybe you were fighting a certain weed that's now cleared up and it's not a problem anymore. Uh, but there's always something new. And this year, for you all up there in the New Jersey area, I believe this is it. It's that wet feet summer. We should make a t-shirt, wet feet summer. Uh, no one would buy it. But uh, but yeah, I think that that, actually don't Google that. <laughs> I said in my last video, I was going to make, <laughs> I was going to make a hose called guaranteed to kink. And I said, don't Google that guaranteed to kink. Uh, I don't know if anybody picked up on that. I think that's pretty funny. Don't Google that because you don't know what you're going to find. And don't Google wet feet summer. Don't Google that because I don't, I don't think you're going to find what you think. <laughs> wow, what a good ramble to start today. Well, we got a few topics we're going to cover, and um, it won't have to do with wet feet or the wet or any of, the, uh, of your other fetishes that you guys have, but it will have to do with just some basic things that I'm seeing people asking around uh, the Facebook groups. If you search the Lawn Care Nut group and you see on Facebook, and there I have two. I have a private one that is for people that buy the ebook, but I also have a public one, and I actually spend a, quite a bit more time in there because those people have more questions. But I have a public one. It's called the Lawn Care Nut on Facebook. You can search it. You will see my New Balance shoes at the top. That's how you know that that's the right group. Please feel free to join there. These are some uh, different questions I've seen from that group as well as a couple others. And then some personal emails I've gotten here and there from people that I keep in contact with. Got a lot of things, got a lot of a pulse on what's going on and figure we'll just do that a good old fashioned podcast where we just do straight up lawn tips all the way through and talk about what's going on in lawns across America here in July of 2023. Let's get into it. All right, so the first one I'm going to give my friends with Bahia grass a little bit of love. And I know that most of you don't even know what Bahia grass is. Bahia grass is a, a grass that grows here in Florida. I think there's some in Louisiana and a little bit in Mississippi. I don't know anywhere else. It is a pass palum. So you guys have heard about pass palum being grown in golf courses. There's a couple guys in South Florida growing some seashore Pass Palum that is just beautiful when it's cut low. Such an incredible grass type that I hope to work with one day. Well, it, it just so happens that uh, Bahia grass is also a Pass Palum. Uh, and I don't know if I'm saying that right. I don't really care. Everybody says I say the word Bahia incorrectly. Let's talk about that real quick. Do I say the word Bahia incorrectly? It is spelled B-A-H-I-A. And uh, it is also the name of a state in Brazil. I'm reading right here, B-A-H-I-A, Bahia, meaning Bay, is one of the 26 states of Brazil located in the northeast region of the country. Oh, look at this. Wikipedia says I can listen. Let's see if you can hear it. So this is how Wikipedia says you should pronounce Bahia. 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 Okay, well, I don't, that sounds like Bahia. Bahia. Okay, I'm going to get some Bahia grass. Hey, uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, that's some really nice Bahia grass. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm making fun of myself because apparently I pronounce it wrong when I say Bahia. Now, what's interesting is when you talk to people that tell me I'm telling them wrong, they don't pronounce it Bahia. They pronounce it Bahia. So we'll leave alone that, that Wikipedia says it's pronounced Bahia, Bahia. Okay, we'll leave that alone, and we'll say that there are two ways to pronounce this grass type. There's Bahia, like I pronounce it, and there's Bahia, like they say you're supposed to. And let me tell you, a couple of people in the comments took me to task. One guy was having a good time saying his family was laughing at me. Another guy was just he, beside himself, literally. He, he couldn't believe it. I think he maybe, maybe used the term, goodness gracious sakes alive, before he dressed me down. Did your dad ever say that? Goodness gracious sakes alive, son. I think that's what this guy said. So 
obviously a boomer. But either way, uh, let's just look at it logically. B-A-H-I-A, okay? So if I do that and I say ba-hi-ya, ba-hi-a, ba-hi-a, that is it, ba-hi-a. If you were a fifth grader and, or a, a kindergartner and you were learning basic consonants and vowels, valves, <laughs> vowels, you would say ba-hi-a, that's what you would say. You would not say ba-hi-a because those letters don't exist. B-A-H, ba-hi, would have to be B-A-H-E-Y-A, ba-hi-a, or B-A-H-A-Y-A, A-E-H-E, ba-hi-a, just do it. It's too many letters. They don't exist. You have to add an A or an E in there to get ba-hi-a. So you guys are pronounced it that way. There's not enough letters for you to do that. I don't, I don't know who you think you are, that you can just, just add letters to a word that's been around for hundreds of years and, and, and according to Wikipedia is natively pronounced Bahia. I don't understand who do you think you are, right? I mean, you're the one that's changing basic grammar here. Uh, so don't grammar police on me now. All kidding aside, I will say that I was born in Pinellas County, and uh, my lawn growing up was Bahia. Most of the lawns in my neighborhood were. I grew up off of 46th Street and 23rd Avenue North. 23rd Avenue North and 46th Street, right? So um, it's called Distant Ridge. Uh, it's basically the center of the city. It, it, every house is a block home that looks the same. They were all two-bedroom ones. I think some of the ones that sat on the lakes, there's a lot of lakes all around. Um, Leslie Lake Drive was one block away. The houses that sat on the lakes may have been three twos, which, but you have to realize these houses were built in the 60s, and so two ones were, were pretty much the standard. It's not like today. Y'all don't realize we have high ceilings, giant homes, all this square footage. It's, it, houses are built so much different now all across the country. There's so much larger open concept, things like this. Bathrooms are giant. You guys have been in old houses with tiny bathrooms, right? So we had a two one. My dad had added on to it um, and made it a three two uh, over the years, but Either way, that was where I grew up, and all the lawns there were Baha'i. The only people that didn't have Baha'i were outside of the center of the city. They were the rich people, so out towards the water. And when you're in St. Pete, it's a peninsula. You have Tampa Bay on one side and the Gulf of Mexico on the other, so you are a peninsula also. So you're pretty much surrounded by water um, from west to south to east. And with that, when you people, rich people want to live on the water. So out towards the Tampa Bay side, that's where you had what was called Old Northeast and you had Shore Acres, which Shore Acres wasn't all rich. It was Shore Acres is a very interesting place. But the edges of Shore Acres are giant homes. You have Snell Isle. That's where the real rich people live. There's a country club there, all that. All the kids I went to high school with, a lot of them lived on Snell Isle. So those people all had St. Augustine grass, because that was the rich person's grass. And my that's just how I grew up seeing it, right? Um, I never even got to mow. Uh, oh, I shouldn't say that. Uh, I could talk about Doc Stevens one block down. He had um, St. Augustine grass in my neighborhood. He was like the only one or two that did. But anyway, back to it. So I grew up with Bahia grass. So to me, that was grass. And my dad was not a lawn person. I mowed lawns as a kid, but it wasn't like I cared about how they looked. I mowed them for money to get the heck out of here, right? Um, so I could go to the, go to the movies with my girlfriend or whatever. So I, I wasn't a lawn care guy that loved the way the lawn was. I just mowed cause I did, but most of the lawns I mowed as a kid were not good looking lawns. They were Bahia grass. They were just big giant seed heads popping up everywhere with that Y shape, which you'll see on past palums too. That's the whole thing. That's how you know it's a past palum, but it's one of those grasses that is always looked down upon. This is what I'm getting to. Even today, um, Bahia lawns are planted and when they plant a Bahia lawn, you'll see that the houses are smaller. Like in, if you go into new construction areas in areas that, I mean, I'm not being cruel here, but just areas that aren't as nice as others, but there's still some new construction there. They're, they're, they're cheaper homes, starter homes, maybe you call them. Maybe they may call it that new starter homes that are around in my area down here. And I'm South now I'm in the Bradenton area. I'm in Manatee County. There's a lot of growth in Manatee County, a lot of open fields that are turning into houses. And depending where you're at, if they're building affordable housing, maybe that's the term you use. I don't freaking know. That if, you, if it's affordable housing or starter homes, those are going to have Baha'i lawns because they're trying to keep the cost down, uh, I, I guess. But they have Baha'i lawns these days. Whereas if you go to, um, yeah, and I do think that is because they're also not irrigated, so that does keep costs down. Whereas if you go to areas like Lakewood Ranch, okay, that's, that's where our office is. Yeah, I'm glad to have an office in Lakewood Ranch, whatever. Here, all the lawns are zoysia or St. Augustine grass, right? Those are more expensive. They're associated with better homes. I'm, I'm just... Just rambling here. I hope this doesn't offend anyone. 
But nowadays, what you'll also find is when they try to keep costs down, that they'll do St. Augustine in the front and Bahia in the back. And I I guess it's because they'll have the front irrigated, right? So they can make everybody think that's driving down the road. Look at how beautiful this little neighborhood is with all these pretty Baha'i, with all these pretty St. Augustine grass lawns that are all irrigated. Oh, it's so beautiful. Where in the back lawns are just trashed, you know, unirrigated Baha'i that's dormant half the year. I don't know. Do you guys feel like that, that live in those areas? I don't, I don't know. But either way, that's how Baha'i has always looked at. Now, I have come to not like that. Um, I... I, I, I don't know why. I just don't. I, I think Baha'i is cool. I think it's neat. It's almost, man, how do I say this? It's like a, it's like a thing now where people that, because Baha'i is looked down on as a grass type the way it is, and you'll see people in my comments. This is just me. Look at my comments. People tell you, kill that lawn. Get rid of it. They just hate Baha'i. That's, that's, that trash should only be on a roadside, people will say. Right? I mean, you'll see it. So it's a thing. Well, now what's happening is some people, and I'm one of those now, what we want to do is I want to grow the most beautiful Baha'i lawn so that I can just throw it in your face because you want to look down on this grass type. Well, then I'm going to prop this grass type up and I'm going to make it cool again. I want to make Baha'i cool again. Make another t-shirt. Make Baha'i cool again. So why do I pronounce it the way I do? Well, in Pinellas County, a good amount of the lawns I grew up around, like I said, were Baha'i grass. And everyone around me pronounced it that way. So we would, we would know who there was uh, local guys that would mow lawns in the area that my dad would talk to sometimes. And I'd be standing there in the driveway or whatever, and I'd hear him. And it was Bahia grass. So my dad would stop and ask people questions about the lawn. He didn't like grass. He didn't like the lawn. He does now. I got him hooked on the lawn care nut stuff. But uh, when we were kids, that wasn't his thing. My dad built cabinets and things like that. He was a, a carpenter kind of dude and a fireman. Lawns were not his thing. So he would ask for advice here and there. I remember one time he tried to plug St. Augustine and it all died. So he tried over the years, and that's what I'm saying. I would go to places where he would go to uh, do lawn care or buy the mower. We had a Honda mower growing up. It was our first really good mower. And uh, I would just listen, and I would hear people pronouncing it Bahia. Now, on top of that, I, um, I got some more validation on the way that I pronounce it when I met Mark Govan. So Mark Govan is a guy who has um, passed away now. He passed away at GIE Expo uh, a couple years. Not at, sorry, not at GIE. He, he passed away while we were at um, GIE Expo. I'm trying to Google him right now because I want to give you, it's called ABC Pest Control um, is the company that he owned. Uh, and his family still owns it. Let's see, Largo, Florida. So see Pinellas County, ABC Pest Control. So Mark he ran the local gardening. Sorry, I didn't pay him enough due respect. The guy was awesome. He was one of the guys originally when I started working with uh, John Perry and Green County Fertilizer. I was a little bit skeptical of humic acid and sea kelp and stuff. I had never used that. Y'all know I'm a true green guy, right? So I was all about big nitrogen and starter fert fixes everything. That's how I did lawns, man. And malorganite's great because you can throw a bunch of it down and it won't burn the lawn even if you make a mistake, right? Those were my original things. And by the way, I know that malorganite has some organic material in it, so that's good for the soil, right? Uh, that, that's how I started. I'm an NPK guy, a little bit of iron. That's about all I knew about. And then I met John. He's like, hey, let's try some of these biostimulants. Let me show you what they can do. They can, they can extend the, the, the use of your, your products that you're using. They can make them better. They can make the soil better. They can flush out nutrients. We have different ones that do this. Sea kelp can help for deeper roots. These are biostimulants, right? I was skeptical of that stuff, floofy doofy stuff. You know, I'm not wearing Birkenstocks. I wear tennis shoes, bro. So I'm not into all that barefoot stuff, but I wanted to learn it. I wanted to understand it. And so what John said was, hey, and I sat through a couple of his courses that he teaches, and he said, why don't you talk to a couple of these guys in your area? And one of them was Mark Govin. So I called Mark, and we had a conversation, and uh, he invited me to come on his radio show. He had the, the radio show here. Let me. I'm pretty sure his daughter runs it now. Let's see. Tampa Bay Morning Radio Sunday. It is... Um, gardening. I've been on the sh I was on the show twice. Florida gardening. Jeez, what a what a what a name. I should have remembered that. Florida gardening. And yeah, it is still going. Megan. So Megan uh no, it isn't. These are it looks like the last time it was updated was 2020. So Megan is his daughter. She's called the Bug Girl. Um she was running it for a while. Anyway, Mark ran the Florida gardening call-in show. So everybody that's grown up anywhere in America, you had to know that there was a local gardening question and answer call in show on AM or FM radio. This is on FM, but it may have been on AM in the past. But um, there's always this local gardening show you can call into. And I used to love listening to 
shows like this when I was young. And I, I'm pretty sure it was Florida Gardening to listen to. I don't know for sure when I was a kid. I listened to some gardening shows here and there. My dad did. They were on WSUN, if everybody remembers that. Uh, that's also where Paul Harvey was broadcast, was on WSUN um, in Florida. But either way, I listened to those shows. My dad would listen to those too. And so Mark, he ran the Florida Gardening call-in radio show on Sundays for many years. Um, and obviously he ran and owned ABC Pest Control and Pest Control and Lawn Care. And they used Green County Fertilizer products. And so that's why um, John had said, hey, maybe you should go talk to him. Hold on. I got to stop my dog from barking. I don't know if y'all can hear that. Okay. Got him, to, got him to stop. And so Mark told me, yeah, we used the products. They work great. We, we used the microgreen in the summer for this and that. I mean, we went through all of those different things. And so he was somebody that helped me to understand, yeah, these things are legit. And now, of course, years later, thousands and tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of gallons sold now. And then I can see the way our customers' lawns look and, you know, lots of things. So really awesome that uh, I was able to connect with Mark that way. And again, rest in peace, Mark. He did pass away a couple of years ago. So, um, but I got to go on his radio show a couple of times. This is what I was getting to with Bahia. This is a really long, drawn-out discussion here or whatever, but I think it's fun. So we were on the radio show one day, and I'll pull the clip and play it for you. There's really only three or four grasses in our mm -hmm. central Florida area. Uh, you got St. Augustine grass, you've got Bahia grass, you got a few people with zoysia, and even less with uh, Bermuda. Yeah, and so and I have actually, and it stays a nice silvery blue as well. Now you pronounce. I have a question. You pronounced it Bahia. Sure. I get you're in trouble. Saying Bahia, Bahia. Bahia. No, I pronounce it Bahia. I'm a St. Petersburg native. I was born and raised, and we always called it Bahia as yes. well. But I always get made fun of for not pronouncing it correctly. So thank you for proving me right. It's Mark. Bahia. So thank you very I, much. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll stick with Bahia grass. Me I mean, too. Uh, now, if they want to call it Bahia, 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 all right, whatever. Uh, but. But we were on the radio show one day and uh, just talking things. And he had to say the word and he said, Bahia grass. And he pronounced it that way, Bahia. And I stopped. I said, hey, wait a minute. How did you just pronounce that? And he even said, oh, oh are you going to tell me it's pronounced Bahia? <laughs> like, no, you pronounce it like me. He's a Pinellas County guy, Largo, Florida. So what I'm getting at, and, and I would be curious to know if any of you have listened to this long diatribe, if you are from Pinellas County, do you pronounce it Bahia? And I don't know about today. You know, the way the internet works, people can hear how things are pronounced now. But you have to realize before there was an internet, you had regional dialects that you only pronounce things the way people around you did. And I'm wondering if you're an old school person from St. Pete or Largo or Dunedin or wherever, uh, Tarpon Springs, did you pronounce it Bahia grouse or do you pronounce it Bahia? All right, y'all. So one thing I'm noticing a lot of here recently, and I get this every summer, but this summer especially because of how rainy it is across New England and even a lot of the Midwest, is cool season lawns. And I mentioned this in the introduction here. Cool season lawns that are like rain drunk and they're they're struggling, right? They got some, some strange appearance. We'll just say it that way because I don't want to use any words like brown or yellow um, or lime green. I don't want to use those words because you have to understand that this is the nature of cool season grass. So remember, we go back to our growth curves. And for those of you listening, I'll explain it. If you're on YouTube, you can see the, the graphics. But remember, cool season grass, it has two growth humps, spring and fall. Those are the times when it's going to grow well. And the reason that cool season grass has adapted to grow well during the spring and fall is because that's when temperatures are mild. That's when you have adequate moisture, lower humidity for the most part, as well as, um, yeah, that's it. That's what those grass types have adapted to grow well in. So now you get to summer. Now, what is a typical summer in areas where cool season grass grows? And I'm not talking about Washington State or Seattle, Wash, you know, Seattle, Washington, where it rains every day. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about lawns across the Midwest and through the East, right? Cool season lawns. What typically happens in the summer? Well, typically what happens is you get a little bit of rain here and there, and then you supplement in between with irrigation. That would be like a perfect year. Maybe maybe if your lawn needs one and a half inches per week, maybe you get a quarter inch to a half inch of that in rain, and then the rest you make up with with your irrigation. That's kind of like the perfect scenario, right? In those times, though, 
Are you hammering the lawn with nitrogen? You're not if you're following my plans. We're going to stress blend, which has some nitrogen, 7%, which of 50% is slow release. It puts down one quarter pound of nitrogen when you apply stress blend. That's it. It's not very much. Does it turn the lawn green? Yes, it's enough to do that. I actually have some AMS in there now that helps with that, as well as 3% iron that helps with that. Um, but mostly we go to potassium. Why is that? Well, because cool season lawns, remember the growth humps in spring and fall, that means it's at a low point in the summer it doesn't want to grow in the summer. It's not adapted to that. It would rather actually slumber, and if it doesn't get enough water, it'll just go dormant. And by the way, that's fine. I always use the, the, the idea of grass on the side of the highway. And again, we're talking about a normal year here. Grass on the side of the highway doesn't get watered, so it can go dormant during the summer a lot of times, especially if you're not getting rain. Nobody's watering highway grass, right? So if you don't get rain, what does it do? It goes dormant. But next spring, is it green again? Sure it is. And so your lawn, it, it's cool season grass. It's going to work the same way. So now we come to a year like this where we have lots and lots of rain. And lots and lots, that's a technical term, right? I don't know. I haven't studied how many inches it is, but I can just see you guys talking about it in the groups about how much rain there is. Now, some lawns are benefiting from that. They're well-drained. They have good airflow around them. They have good sun composition. You just got the luck of the draw in genetics sometimes with with the lawn itself or location, it's just like people, right? Some people have really good genetics that predispose them to be great at a certain sport um, or certain things they can do physically. Some people are born in a certain area where they learned a trade that is taking place in that area, and so they learn that trade really well, right? This is the same thing with grass. Grass is going to, all grass is going to grow in different places in different ways. It's going to react differently, um, and so what you have to realize though, is that cool season grass, if it's looking bad, it's not your fault. And it's not always something you can correct because even if you do have disease or if you, you know, have, have whatever disease is usually what you guys are concerned about. You're going to hear me mention that a lot in this podcast. It doesn't mean that you're going to be able to necessarily fix everything because your grass itself does not want to grow. So you have to realize how do you get damaged grass to grow back or grow out when it doesn't want to grow. Just think about that. There's really not a way to make your cool season grass grow faster in the summer when it's when it's hot out, when it's 85 or 90 degrees. It's just not going to do it. And even if you get cooler temperatures, the grass still in its in its uh, DNA, in its habit knows that the summer is a time to chill and it will chill. It just does that. You can't change the nature of of things in in a, in a drastic way. Yes, you can make incremental improvements here and there. Um, you can do things to make things work better or be more efficient, but you can't change the nature of things at the at the jump. So what happens is some of you who have had too much rain and you got wet feet in your lawn and the lawn has got some disease or it's turned yellow in spots because it's rain drunk or whatever it is. Now you're like, well, what do I do? The answer is stick to the program and let it work itself out, okay? Because that's what's going to happen to it. It's, it's almost like the common cold with humans. We don't have a cure for the common cold. Uh, you just have to do, deal with it. Now, there are things you can do to help, like coldies, right, which is vitamin C and zinc. And, and they say that that will drastically shorten the span of a cold. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but they're allowed to advertise that. But it's a similar type of thing. I do use coldies or something similar. I take a lot of vitamin C and zinc whenever I feel a cold coming on. I get ahead of it. Uh, if I don't get ahead of it, I take it during. Does it work? I don't know. But it is a, something you can do. But you can't cure the cold itself. All you can do is strengthen your body to let your body naturally flush the cold out or work its way through the cold that you have, right? That's the same with the lawn. The lawn's nature in summer, cool season lawns, I want to keep stressing that, their nature is to chill in the summer. So when they get a disease, it doesn't matter what you throw at it. You might throw all the fungicides in the world at it and the disease will stop, but it's going to stay brown or yellow or whatever color it is for a while because it's not going to grow out. It has to just, dead stuff doesn't come back to life. Dead stuff has to break down and new stuff has to grow in to replace it. Just so you guys know, dead grass, it doesn't come back to life. It just doesn't. Dormant grass does, and that's a whole other thing we could talk about. But you have to just be patient and wait. And I'm sorry that that's the way it is, but this is how some seasons work. I'll go back to the human analogy. There are some years where you don't get the cold or the flu. There are some years where you do, right? Did you do anything wrong the year that you got the flu or a cold and the year before you did everything right? No, it just happens. It's just 
the nature of things. And when you do get that cold or flu, you don't stop eating. This is the other thing that people do, right? They get scared. I've, I've said this before. Oh, somebody told them in some group that if you put nitrogen down on a diseased lawn, it's going to cause the disease to get worse. That is not always the case. In the case of Dollar Spot, for example, you want a lot of nitrogen. I just saw this in one of the groups the other day. Somebody had Dollar Spot, and people were telling them it's caused by nitrogen. It, no, bro, bro, that's your cure. In fact, instead of throwing a chemical at it, which you could use propiconazole if you wanted to, it works very well, actually. But why? Just throw nitrogen at it. Well, part of the problem is the lawn doesn't want to grow fast, so you can throw nitrogen at it. It can help, but it won't necessarily grow it out as fast as if is if this was in the spring or the fall, which Dollar Spot doesn't happen in the spring or fall, right? Dollar Spot's opportunistic. It takes place when the grass is already low. So in that case, what do you do? Well, sure, put the Kims on it and cure it up. What I would say, put down the nitrogen, stick to the program, continue mowing properly, continue watering when you need to. If you have a lot of rain and it's overwatered, that's nature winning again. There's nothing you can do about it. So just work through it. Just like you work through that flu, the bug that you get. Sometimes the flu puts you down in bed. Sometimes you can work your way through it. It just depends. This is how lawns are. But what I do want you to be cognizant of is don't ever throw chemical at things as your first choice. Sometimes just allow nature to take its course. And what will happen, you'll find, is the strong will survive. The grass that survives through that, you would think, logically, that's the strongest grass, right? Well, great, thanks. Now what I can do is if I do have long-term damage, is in the fall, this is with cool season lawns, I can seed in some new cultivars that are a little bit less prone to whatever disease I had. And you can do that with cool season grass. It's, it's quite simple. Just do your research. Which grass types are less susceptible to brown patch or less, which, you know, for example, if you do have brown patch as a problem, turf type tall fescue, highly successful, susceptible Whereas Kentucky bluegrass, not as susceptible. So if that was your problem, maybe you seed in something that's more Kentucky bluegrass based rather than tall fescue. Um, if you have, uh, you know, so that's the idea, right? Let's work on improving the lawn's health overall while we deal with the problem that we have and make a strategy that'll help you in the future. You're not going to get a super wet year every year either. So this may be something that doesn't even crop up for the next four years. Let, let's go to another one. Let's go to a warm season example. And I'm going to show you a picture I found in a Facebook group. And I'm not going to um, put up the guy's name or anything because I'm not trying to call anyone out. I'm just trying to help you all. So this is a picture I'm showing here of St. Augustine grass. And what you have is you have about a, you have a circle, almost a perfect circle. That's maybe, I'm guessing, six feet wide maybe. Um, and that is like a lighter yellowish green. So outside the St. Augustine grass is green. And then you see this circle that's like that's six feet. What is that called? Diameter? Six feet in diameter. That is like a yellow color. And in the middle is a dead spot that's maybe a foot in diameter. Okay. And so the guy posts up, hey, what do you think this is? Is it insects or disease? And some of the things that people are saying is it's disease, it's insect. You don't know. This is the other challenge, right, on Facebook. And I'm, again, I'm not coming down on y'all. I'm just trying to get you to stop putting chemical as your first fix to everything. I, I realize the pharmaceutical companies have taught you that when your body has a problem, that chemicals are the first thing that you should apply and not improve your diet. Because if you want to know what the greatest cure for sickness in your body is, it's a good diet, okay, right? Nutrients, how about that? You know, things like zinc, potassium, vitamin C. These are nutrients, right? These are what are going to make your body healthy, not pharmaceuticals. So stop throwing the pharmaceuticals at the grass as the first thing you do. First thing you do, actually, when it comes to this spot that I'm talking about here in St. Augustine grass that's got a yellow spot and then a dead spot in the middle, and it's one single isolated spot, the person said that, the first thing you should do is dig. Now, what I don't know and what I don't have in a Facebook group is what did this look like one week ago, two weeks, three weeks, two months, three months, two years ago? I don't know any of those things, right? And chances are you don't either because in Florida, for example, in a year where we have a lot of rain, problems are masked because the, if, especially if you have St. Augustine grass, but Bermuda to an extent too, but St. Augustine grass especially, areas can die out and just recover almost within days because of how fast St. Augustine grass grows and how thick the stolons are and how they can just fill in when one when one dies, another stolon is waiting. It's a huge competition in a, in a St. Augustine grass lawn for sure with those stolons, right? So what what could happen is this, this disease, this problem in this, I, I said disease, I don't mean that, this circle with this dead patch, this could have been a problem for years. But if we had heavy rain years or normal rain years, because again, let's go back to our growth humps with 
warm season grass, it's the exact opposite of cool season. Instead of having a growth spurt in spring and fall, we have a growth spurt that's a long ramp through summer. In spring and fall, we are struggling, right? So this is a warm season grass. This is St. Augustine grass. Right now, we get rain in Florida every afternoon. However, and I don't know what part of Florida the guy's in, but we are having a, a, a severe drought. I'm calling it severe. We haven't had the rain that we normally have here where I'm at, which is kind of was Bradenton, which is kind of Tampa Bay area, kind of Southwest Florida. Um, all the rain has been stopping like in St. Pete, which is just above us and not coming down here. Now we just got some yesterday, but what I'm trying to tell you is when we have normal rain patterns, which is rain every afternoon, the St. Augustine grass will mask almost all problems because it just grows through the problem, right? Now this year it might be dry. I'm just giving you some examples, right? I'm playing detective. I'm saying what you should do instead of going to Facebook and going, I have a brown spot. Is it disease or insects? You should go through the same exact thing that I'm going through in my, with you right now, right? I'm looking at weather patterns. What's different? What did I, why did I not notice that last year? Right? So that's the thing. Then the other thing you notice, uh, or that you should do again is dig because to me, the spot looks like there used to be a tree there and there are tree roots that are shallow that are still sucking nutrients from the St. Augustine grass. That's why it's yellow in that circle. In the middle, maybe there's a stump that was ground just below the surface that you're not seeing, and grass just isn't growing there because there's not enough water, so it's revealing this weakness. Whereas if we had rain every day, it would just continually grow through. It would be enough for the St. Augustine grass to, to grow through. Just like if you guys know, if you let a St. Augustine grass stolen go long enough, it'll grow three feet across your driveway. There's no soil there, but it's getting fed from its other end, Right. Um, so that's the same thing that happens in these dead spots where there's there's uh, there's a, a stump underneath. Well, the, the stolons just grow across that and mask it. But in a year when we don't have a lot of rain, now it's showing. Again, I'm just throwing out ideas because I don't know what this spot looked like last week, two weeks, three weeks, three months, three years ago. I'm playing detective, but always dig first. Don't just reach for the chemical. Again, I, and I don't think you do that with your body. I hope if you get a spot on your skin... Listen, what is it notorious? And I'm not saying this is right, but men are notorious for not wanting to go to the doctor. I'm that way. I don't want to go to the doctor. I'm 50 years old now. I got to get a colonoscopy. Ugh. I should have got one when I was 40, right? Yeah, go ahead. You guys get on me. It's true. But I'm a typical dude. And when I get something on my skin, like a, a, a spot or whatever, what do I do? I just watch it. I monitor it. I see if it changes color. And your dermatologist tell you to do that too, right? Um, and if it does change color, what's a dermatologist say? All right, well, come in. But they don't just give you some fungus cream or they don't just cut it off your skin immediately unless they know because they're a trained doctor. Oh, I actually am looking at like squamous or whatever skin cancer is, right? A trained doctor would know. But us on Facebook, homeowners, looking at a brown spot on the skin of our lawn, we don't know. This is another reason why I tell you to call your local county extension office. They are there to help you. I, I don't know if you guys realize this, but your tax dollars pay for those universities to have these offices in your area. That's what a uh, an extension office is, an extension of your land-grant university. What's a land-grant university? That's a state-funded university. And I, I'm not in the university system. I might be saying this wrong. I didn't go to real college uh, most of what I see coming out of real college turns me off, if I'm honest. Most of the, the academics and lawn care that, not most, some of the academics that I've talked to in lawn care are, are not nice people, right? They're, so I, I'm not really impressed with college. But the, your, your tax dollars pay for this extension office, and I do think the extension agents, those are, just, those are just people in your area, man. They're just normal locals like you. They're there to help you. So call them up. Hey, what can I do? I got this spot. What are you seeing? They will help you with these things. They're probably going to tell you the same thing I did just now because you just can't tell. If you show me a brown spot today that wasn't there or that I haven't seen anything else, no other context except a picture on Facebook and somebody asking if it's disease, I have no idea what that is. Now, there are cases where you can tell because of patterns. You can see the leaves up close. You, there are cases you can, but in the case of this, in the case of what I'm mostly seeing online, it's just a picture, it's a dead spot, is it disease, and multiple people telling them to throw down disease X, or I threw down disease X and it didn't work, so I'm going to go get whatever, a Caravan G, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, man, I'm telling you, you guys, we have to be careful with these things because they're going to get outlawed. Um, that's what's going to happen. They're just going to take this stuff away if, if it's continually abused. And I'm talking about these IDES. I'm talking about pesticides here okay i'm talking about things that are chemicals that kill something that's what an id is id id is death it's kill right homicide 
right? Think of pesticides like homicide. You should, you should just make that your last resort and you should make sure that you're standing your ground and you got the castle law in effect, then go ahead and put your eyes down. You know what I'm saying? Oh man, I was on a roll and I got a stinking spam call. So anyway, that's a little bit of a rant there, but I'm just asking you all to step back. The other thing is, I, I, I haven't said this in a while. If you're in your forever home, then just you're going to be there 30 years. Why not take a step back and just watch what happens? Learn that land. I, I've told you, I know the spots in my lawn that are going to get large patch every single year. And they do. This year, I actually have some large patch in those spots, but it's not that severe. And I, I mean, I don't have no idea why. We've been super humid. We haven't had all the rain, that is for sure. So we've been dry, but we've been very humid. I mean, in the mornings, it's it's like 76% humidity at 9 a.m. And, and, the, and the grass stays wet for long periods of time from dew. I can see the disease. Me, I can because I know my land, but my neighbors driving by have no idea because it's mostly masked. And, and going back to the St. Augustine grass deal, it will grow out. I don't care if you lose big spots in your St. Augustine grass. It's okay. Why put the chemical down? Let it take its course and then just the next year help it recover. The The worst extreme was my my uh, St. Augustine grass project from this year, which was a chinch bug damage issue, which is different. And I'll talk about uh, insects in a minute. But I was able to recover that lawn in three months with just fertilizing. And that was in the dry season. In the spring, in the winter, really, it started in January, when St. Augustine grass lawns don't want to grow much because the days are too short. Now, we're in Florida, South Florida, so it's year-round. The grass didn't go dormant. So I do have that going for me, but it's not growing prolifically in January like it is now in July, not even close. But I was still able to recover it very quickly because that's why it's a self-repairing grass. That's what St. Augustine grass is. Now, on the flip side, with cool season lawns, let them die too, and then you reseed. Seed is cheap, so throw her down. It's not cheap, but I'm just saying, reseed with something better, with something that is more resistant to that disease. That's going to be a lot better course of action than every year just deciding every brown spot, I'm going to throw fungicide at it, right? And again, if it's your forever home over the years, it only takes two or three years, really three, maybe four, you're going to know. You're going to know what these things are. And, and, and these spots that you get, you're going to be able to know what they are um, because you've played detective over the years and you're not asking for a quick fix on Facebook with one picture with zero context. So just be careful of that. Now back to the insects. This goes back to this, the same thing. Someone asking, what do you think the brown spot is? Insect or disease? Well, I can tell you that with insects, my friends, you can catch them. It's okay to go back to being a kid and go catch some bugs. I don't know why we get to be adults and we don't want to put our hands in the dirt and catch bugs anymore. I used to love catching bugs. We caught lizards. In Florida, you know, we have lizards um, and and they're called brown anoles. By the way, don't don't Google search brown anole or at least don't spell it, misspell it if you do. <laughs> but but they're called brown anoles and we also have green anoles. They're cool. You don't see them as much. Um, but we have lizards. When I was a kid, we would catch lizards and then we would catch bugs and feed them to the lizards, right? And all kinds of stuff. So why don't you just get back to your childhood Get your hands down in the dirt and start digging. And if it's bugs, you'll find them. Now, you got to do a little research first. I'm mostly talking about chinch bug. I'm seeing this coming up a lot, too. People are posting on Facebook. My neighbor has a giant dead spot, and it's spreading. Should I throw down whatever to kill him? Right? We talked about that. It's arena. I would say test first. Find the bugs. I, I don't even need to do the coffee can test to find chinch bug. I can just go in and the lawn and dig around enough, and I'll usually find them. Um, so with insects, it's a lot different. It's a kill. This is going to come up with grubs. And that's why I'm really talking about this. When we get to, I'm going to say later August, but really into September, what's going to happen is there's going to be lawns that were struggling during the summer in some areas that didn't get a lot of rain. They may have gone dormant and they're going to start to wake up. Things are going to start to be growing normally again. Things are going to start to repair themselves. Cause again, fall and cool season lawns, we talked about the growth humps, right? That's a time when things are more mild and the grass is already naturally because of the way it was bred. It's growing faster. It's thickening. It's strengthening in fall. More roots, more top growth, right? That's a fall thing for cool season lawns. It's just what they do. And so what will happen is there will be areas, though, that will not come back. They will not green up and they will be laying flat. And that can be where their grubs are. And so people will go, well, should I throw something down for grubs? And my first response, and I'm asking those of you that see these posts coming up, your first response is, 
If you have grubs, you will find them. So do not apply a grub curative, which Dilox is probably the easiest thing to find. Do not apply a grub curative until you actually find grubs. And the way you'll find grubs is right around the dead areas where the dead areas border the green. That's where you start digging because that's where they'll be, right? They're not digging in the dead areas. They already ate those roots out. They already killed those. So they're moving along and they're doing what they do and they're taking out the good, fresh grass roots. So don't apply any insecticide until you actually find the insects. It, it should be logical that that's what you do, but I think people, again, they want to throw down the pharmaceutical. They've been You've been trained that pharmaceuticals are where you go, man. You got a headache? Oh, take some Tylenol. Well, m maybe you should just drink some water, bro. Maybe you're just dehydrated. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, my knee hurts. I'll, I'll, I'll take some Advil. No, why don't you just, why does your knee hurt? What did you do yesterday? Did you work out harder? Did you do something outside and squat and bend a lot? I mean, don't do that anymore. Why, why put pharmaceuticals in your body? You know, and I'm the first one to use pharmaceuticals too. I'm kind of preaching to myself here. I'm just saying we got to get away from that, that, that I'd idea first. Don't always go first with the homicidal pesticidal application. Find the bug, ID the bug, then use your judgment to apply a chemical if need. And just to go ahead and kind of put a bow on this, I guess. I'm, I'm I, I, I hope I don't sound like I'm coming down on people. Most of y'all that listen to this podcast, you're the more advanced folks. So I'm really kind of, I'm saying to you, this is a community we have here. I hope you see it that way. I hope you see me in the Facebook groups um, every day answering questions and working with you guys. I hope you see me on Twitter answering questions. I answer tons of email questions and tickets. I try to be accessible. And one of the things that I want to put a bow on this with is to understand the natural cycle of your lawn and your grass type. The other thing I see quite a bit, and I'm seeing it mostly with cool season right now because warm season grasses mostly look pretty good, right? Because they're in their growth their growth cycle. They're doing well unless they don't have enough water. But up north, I'm seeing this a lot. My lawn looked great in the spring. I followed the program perfectly, and now all of a sudden in summer, it looks like this, and then there's just this nasty-looking lawn. Again, go back to the natural cycle of what your cool season turf will do. It's not going to perform the same in the summer as it did in the spring and the fall. In the spring and the fall, it may have been masking a lot of the issues because of that milder temps, milder conditions, as well as its natural cycle to grow. Now that it's trying to slumber out in the, in the summer, it's trying to rest. Now these problems are, are being seen. They're manifesting. Now you throw on too much water from rain. That's not your fault. And it manifests worse. So, so don't always just assume that your lawn is going to be perfect year round. There are these things that will cause it to do ups and have ups and downs, just like your health, just like relationships that you have in your life. It's not always wine and roses. Sometimes there's thorns and sometimes there's uh, what warm beer. <laughs> is that the opposite of wine and roses, thorns and warm beer? <laughs> but you get what I'm saying, right? So just Look at this as a long-term thing. That lawn is going to be there for a long time. It's not always going to be perfect. But as you get more experience with it and as you get weather that cooperates with you, then things can level off and you can keep the lawn looking good year-round. But don't, but don't always expect it. And don't get upset when it doesn't happen. Just work through it. That's why this is such a challenge. All right, y'all, next we're going to talk about chinch bug. This is uh, one that can affect up north. I had never seen chinch bug damage when I worked in the Midwest, but uh, a couple years ago, Grass Daddy, if you look at his channel, he got chinch bug in his lawn, and he's somewhere up in New England. Maybe he was in New York at the time. I don't know, somewhere up there. So they do affect up north, but for sure they are often found in Florida. And the big thing about chinch bug is they've become resistant to most of the insecticides that you're going to find at the store, which are pyrethroids. And so they have resistance now. And so what can happen is you get a chinch bug infestation, you you go to use store-bought products, and it doesn't work. And this is what happened to my project lawn, St. Augustine grass, which uh, I took care of this year. Last year, she had sodded with Provista St. Augustine. It was looking good. And then chinch bug came in when she did finally identify it. She tried store-bought products. It didn't work. The damage continued to get worse and worse and worse. And, origin, and eventually she bought a product that did work. And then this year I went in and started working on the grass, fertilizing it a few times. You guys have seen that video. Now it's nice and thick. I need to go back and stop by and take a look at it. 
just to see how it's progressed. But either way, the product that you use, well, first of all, if you think you have chinch bug, I got a picture here from Graham who sent his in before and after on what's happened to his lawn and he believes it might be chinch bug. So the first thing what you want to do is identify. I have identified chinch bug in lawns before. It's pretty easy to find them. Just dig through the brown spots right along the edges of where the green is to the brown and uh, you'll see them. You can dig them up. They'll run around and stuff. It's not hard. Or you can do the float test where you take a coffee can, cut the bottom of it, isolate an area in the soil deep down and then flood it out and they'll float to the top. So that's another way that you can identify if you have chinch bugs. So if you've done that and you now need a product that'll work, what you want to do is get a product called Arena. This is a product that will work. It will kill the resistant ones. And it also does have some continued efficacy, some preventative to it that lasts, some some lasts on. So it's a, it's a preventative and a curative, essentially. But you're going to be using it as a curative in most cases because it's super expensive. If I go on domyown.com, it is $135 for a 30-pound bag. We're actually going to get into the use rates. I'm going to go through the label a little bit with you just for fun and talk about Arena. This is a product that I used to use at True Green as well. We used it for a grub curative. If we had lawns that, for some reason, we just couldn't get the grubs out, we would use Arena for those. But because of its price, it was expensive back, back then. It's expensive now. Um it was kind of a last resort. We'd try to use cheaper products when we could. So let's go through now and let's just talk about it. I'm just going to go. It's actually a new farm product. The label says Valent, but I'm assuming that's because that's all the patents and everything and new farm must have bought them. Um, but I'm just going to read right from the website so you can see Arena G. And this is for those of you that have a really bad chinch bug problem that you've identified and you want to use something that's going to stop them for sure. It says don't settle for insecticides that give up on control early. Get the best control and the longest-lasting residual out there with Arena Insecticide. Arena works as both a preventative and a curative for outstanding control of chinch bugs, white grubs, and broad spectrum of other turf and ornamental pests with a single application. Looks like it's registered in every single state except for New York. I don't know New York. You guys, I don't know. I don't know. You guys don't get a lot of stuff. Proven residual activity for lasting control. Controls pyrethroid-resistant chinch bug without increasing the level of pyrethroid resistance. Controls white grubs, including Japanese beetle and mass shavers, plus other thatch and surface-feeding insects. Superior grub control, including curative grub control that helps keep away foraging animals. Excellent results when applied prior to third instar. Does not require immediate watering in after application, but it does have to be watered in, note. It has to get to the soil to work. Okay, so it can sit there for a little bit without degradation, but you got to water it in. Also available as a 50 WDG wettable dispersible granular formulation for foliar and soil applications. So you could mix some in water and liquid. What I'm looking here at, at is the granular, and that's what most of you are going to use. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through the actual label here. And uh, just see what we can find. Talk about some some things. I think it'll be fun. So Arena Insecticide for Systemic Insect Control in Turf Grasses, Sod Farms, Landscape Ornamentals, Interior Plantscapes, and Non-Bearing Fruits and Nuts. We love those nuts. Now, the interesting thing here is you can use this in landscape beds. That's what it says, landscape ornamentals. Um, so there is instructions there about like spreading it over the top. I guess if you had insect certain insect problems and they're listed here, you can use it in your landscape beds. We're going to talk about Lawns, though, the active ingredient here is clothianidin, C-L-O-T-H-I-A-N-I-D-I-N, clothianidin. So that's kind of interesting. Now, we're going to read through this, and we're going to talk about a little bit more in depth. The first thing I want to talk about is the PPE, because that is extremely important and something to stress. That is personal protective equipment. Applicators and other handlers must wear long sleeve shirt and long pants, shoes plus socks, chemical-resistant gloves, made of any waterproof material such as polyethylene or polyvinyl chloride. Follow the manufacturer's instructions for cleaning, maintaining PPE. So there you go. It's the same as pretty much everything else. Interesting, I've mentioned this before, eye protection's not there. So I don't know if that was something that True Green just taught us, but we were taught to also wear eye protection. Pretty interesting. Keeping going down, this is one I always like to point out, user safety recommendations. Users should... Wash hands before eating, drinking, chewing gum, using tobacco, or using the toilet. One of the most common ways that these chemical 
products get introduced to humans to cause some sort of toxicity. Acute toxicity would be what you think about most times, immediate burn or redness or whatever, acute toxicity. The thing that typically causes that is you've been applying all day. And yeah, you might be wearing your PPE. Of course you are. But when you're applying this product during the day, especially in a granular form, it's going to get onto your skin in some way. It's just going to happen, right? Um, and it will get on your hands, be a little bit there, and then you go to smoke a cigarette, and now you have transferred it to the filter, which then hits your mouth. Um, maybe vapes, maybe this is a good reason to vape or use the Zins, right? No toxicity with a vape. No toxicity with a Zin. But either way, that's what it does. It'll get in your mouth. And then using the toilet, oh my gosh. Some stories there. Not from this product, but from others that actually can burn when you uh, go to the bathroom. So something I always like to read, just make sure you wash your hands after you use this stuff, even if you're wearing your proper PPE. Let's go down. Resistance management. Arena insecticide contains a group 4A insecticide. What is group 4A? You guys know groups are modes of action. And group 4A, those are neonicotinoids. You guys have heard me talk about those before. The neonics, as they're called when you're at one of the cool kid parties. Hey, man, tell me about your neonics. Well, meet me in the bathroom. I'll sell you some neonics, bro. But yeah, your neonicotinoids. What sounds familiar in there? Nicotinoid, nicotine, right? It's your nicotine. And so these are products that kind of operate like that as like an appetite suppressant because that's what nicotine is. And so very interesting. The other one that's very well known there is imidacloprid. That's one that is used for grubs. But imidacloprid, just by the way it works, I guess it's uh, it's slower to get into the plant. So it needs to be applied, you know, several, a couple of weeks for sure. But, you know, best three to four weeks before egg laying, right? So that it can get watered in, get into the soil, be translocated or taken up into the plant, you know, and translocated. It takes that long. It's a little bit slower. And then at least on grubs, imidacloprid doesn't have any curative properties. You could spray it on the lawn that has active grubs. It won't work. Clothianidin, which is also a neonicotinoid, nicotinoid, a group 4A, it does have curative properties. So it's a different chemical. Even though the mode of action is the same, it's still a different chemical. So something else in that is going to cure and kill chinch bug as well as active grubs and then continue to prevent going forward. So it does both. So that's pretty interesting. So group 4A for our, all of our neonic dealers out there selling those neonics across the old United States, that is a mode of action here on the arena. Let's keep going down and see what else we can find. Restrictions. Do not apply more than a total of 160 pounds of arena per acre per season. So that's the max. You're gonna, that's going to come into play when we get into the application rates here in a second. The maximum that you can apply is 160 pounds of arena per season. Okay, so let's just think about that as we continue to go down. Application methods. Arena insecticide is a systemic and soil active insecticide when applied to the soil. So, th and this is a granular we're talking about. So, broadcasting it, that's considered applied to the soil because you got to water it in. So, that's where it says it's systemic and soil active. So, systemic means it gets into the plants and it hangs on and it lasts, keeps, keeps, keeps them safe. And then, soil active means it'll kill anything that's active. That's in the soil right now. So that's pretty cool that it does both. And that's that curative and that preventative that we've been talking about. So let's keep on moving down. And there's different instructions depending on what you're applying on, right? You might be putting it down on, uh, you know, interior plantscapes, landscapes, that kind of stuff. But we're going to go down to the portion of the label that says turf grass. And that's always important too when you're reading through these products. You want to go and make sure you're reading the right part of the label. Some of it will read the same but you always want to make sure you're under the turf grass section. So Arena G insecticide can be applied to turf at 80 to 160 pounds per acre. So there it goes back to that max. So the maximum you can apply is 160 pounds per acre, and the minimum you can apply is 80 pounds per acre. Now I'm going to break that down by 1,000 square feet for you all because that's how we look at things. And that right there is one of the reasons why a lot of folks won't use a professional product because they don't want to deal with that acre conversion. So I'll do it for you. 
and uh, we'll talk through it. Uh, as I'm coming down now, I'm at application on turf grass. I want to start looking at the different pro the different insects that I might be going after because the rates are slightly different. So what we're going to do is we'll just go here to, uh, let's see, what does this say? Chinch bug. Here we go. Or actually, let's do this. Let's just look at the, the minimums and the maximums. So the minimum is 80 pounds per acre and the maximum is 160 pounds per acre. So how do I convert that? Well, an acre is 43,000 500 square feet. So what you do, if you have 80 pounds as your minimum, you take 80 and you divide that by 43.5 and you get 1.84. So 1.84 pounds per thousand square feet is the minimum amount of arena that you should apply, period. 1.84 pounds per thousand, okay? The maximum is 160 pounds per thousand. So let's do the same math. 160 pounds divided by that 43.5. Remember, an acre is 43,500 square feet, right? So we're going to take the 160 pounds divided by 43.5 for 43,500 square feet, and we get 3.67. So the maximum rate is 3.67 pounds per thousand. Now, in this case, you don't want to round. You want to get really close here. So 3.67 pounds per thousand. You want to get as close as you can. What does that mean? Well, if we were going to go after chinch bug, we can see their recommendation is to apply 120 to 160 pounds per acre. Well, let's just think logically there. 120 is the minimum for chinch bug. 160 is the maximum for the product in general, and it is also the maximum for chinch bug. If I was going to try to do two applications, I couldn't do that because I only have 160 that I can use for the entire year. If I did a minimum rate of 120 and it didn't work, all I have left is 40 pounds per thousand or 40 pounds per acre. And 40 pounds per acre is not enough to meet the minimum requirement of 80. Now I'm going to show this on YouTube. I'll put up a picture of this so you can kind of see how this math works. But this is some pretty deep stuff, but it's not really once you figure it out. It's just logical. So if you have chinch bug and you're going to use arena to go after them as a curative, don't even bother with the minimum rate. Just go with the max rate, 160 pounds per thousand, which equates to 3.67 pounds per 1,000 square feet. Now, what kind of cost are we looking at there? I got to break out my calc here again. Let's take a look. So I went back and the arena, I'm on domyown.com. And by the way, this high price this is not their fault. This is what the stuff costs. So if I get a 30 pound bag, right? Um, let's see, 30 pounds. So 135 Point fifty nine divided by 30 pounds means the cost is $4.51, 52 cents a pound. Got to write this down. 452. I, I did most of this ahead of time, but here we go. So 452 per pound. Okay. Now, my application rate per thousand was 3.67, right? You guys remember that? That's my application rate. And again, if you're on YouTube, I'm putting this on the screen so you can read it. So you can get everything you need. So 3.67 times that cost of $4.52 a pound. That means my cost is $16.59 per 1,000 square feet. That is some expensive insecticide. There must be some kind of patent on this bad dog that there's no... Uh, and by the way, if there's a, there's a generic to this, y'all let me know. But sixteen fifty nine per thousand. So I have an 8,000 square foot lawn times 16.59, it would cost me $132. Let me make sure that's right. 16.59 times my 8,000 square foot. Yeah, $132.72 for one application on my lawn. $132, that's expensive app, y'all. I mean, a, a FERD app is like $21 <laughs> for a fertilizer app, just to give you an idea. So $132 for my lawn, that's 8,000 square feet. So very expensive product, but worth it if you have those chinch bug that are getting away from you and starting to cause big dead spots like you see in the pictures here, then it's worth it to get that arena and go after it, go after the chinch bug with it. So I hope this has been helpful to you. I got a lot of math here and stuff, but again, go back and review on the screen if you're on YouTube and you'll be able to see how I break the label down and go through some of the logic, hopefully, to help you dominate those chinch bugs.
All right, here's a good one I got, um, an email. And by the way, I'm not asking y'all to start emailing me. I have quite a bunch of people that have my email that do email me, and I try to answer those questions as much as I can. But please understand, for me to answer questions one-on-one on email is very tough. So if you try to send me one and I don't answer, it's not personal. I try to do as many as I can trying to scale it. That's why I'm starting to do more podcasts again, because I think I can cover a lot. So this one did, this came from a, a gentleman named Don. He says, hey, nut, I live in South Carolina. Three years ago, I put in new St. Augustine sod in my backyard with new dirt under, and it is doing great. Been taking good care of it. However, dollar weed from next door is invading, and I'm so scared to put anything on the weeds to get rid of them, uh, that it, and it's just getting worse. Would you know if there is a weed killer that will kill dollar weed and leave my grass alone? Thanks in advance for any advice you might be able to impart. Sincerely, Don. This is a great question, Don. And I want to encourage you to first not uh, be so fearful of harming your grass. I know you've... Man, my phone is just... Okay. So I know that um, that you, you put a lot into the lawn It costs money, it costs time, and so what happens is you're like, man, it's looking great. I don't want to put anything on there that could harm it. And we're going back to the Ides again. But in this case, we do need to use an Ide because we have a weed called dollar weed that will take out sections of your St. Augustine grass. So I practice integrated pest management, which means I only use the Ide. I only want to use the herbicide, the hard chemical control. When the weeds or whatever the pest is starts to take over or harm or mess up my existing lawn in a way that's going to change what I'm using it for. And so dollar weed would do that. It'll thin the lawn out. It'll take over spots. And so we're all going to use the Ide now. We're going to use the herbicide. So the herbicide that we're going to use is called Celsius. Now, before we get there and we talk about Celsius, let me, let me encourage you, Don, and others of you not to be as afraid of the spray. Um, I, understand, I think of it like this. It, when you're a first-time parent and you have a brand new baby, you you tend to want to shelter the child too much. So those of you that have three or four kids, I have two, but those of you that have three or four kids, sometimes you'll find that the first kid um, is the one that's restricted the most. Can't go here, can't go there because you're scared as parents, right? You don't want to let them too far out of your sight. I don't want you to go more than one street away. These things, right? And then as you get more kids and they get older, they get more freedom, more leeway, Um, And there's a lot of reasons for that. But don't treat your lawn like that brand new baby. Let that baby get out and dig in the dirt and let that baby experience a little bit of bacteria in its system. So as he grows older, he can, you know, resist it. That's that's an analogy, I guess. But don't be afraid to spray the lawn. And I will tell you, when you have a St. Augustine lawn, almost every especially herbicide that you spray on it is going to cause some sort of what I call ding or some sort of. Uh, um, ding. <laughs> I come up with a word. I, I try to change it. It's going to ding it. It's going to stunt it. It's going to do something to it. St. Augustine grass is just that way. It's just sensitive to a lot of things. So Celsius is a weed control that now comes in um, dispo- not disposable, but single-use packs. Used to be you had to buy the, the larger jug that would cover, I don't know, well over an acre, maybe more, and it was hard to measure because the use rate was so low and it was expensive, 150 bucks, I think, for something that would last you way longer than you needed on a tiny lawn. But it still is the very best control for summertime weeds on a St. Augustine grass lawn, on really on any uh, warm season lawn, except for Bahia grass. Do not use Celsius on Bahia grass. Don't do it. But it's good for zoysia, Bermuda, hybrid Bermuda, St. Augustine, centipede. Works fine. Zoysia, if I didn't say zoysia. Works great. However, uh, oh, by the way, and Celsius doesn't have heat restrictions um, to a degree. It does say, though, that if you spray it when it is hotter, I think it's 85, that you can see some stunting of turf growth. And I do see that in my St. Augustine grass. Every time I spray Celsius, um, I zone or spot spray. The zone or the spot where I spray will not grow at the same rate as the rest of the grass for at least a week, maybe eight to 10 days. It stunts the growth, and it can turn it a little bit yellow. When I've sprayed my zoysia with Celsius, the, um, I guess you call that bleaching, the zoysia in the spots I spray will turn a little bit yellow. Now, the weed in the middle of that dies, but the areas around will turn a little bit yellow and, again, stunt the growth. That's not long-term damage. It doesn't hurt anything. The grass bounces back. It comes back, especially with warm-season turf. It's always going to come back. So you have to think, in this case, 
what's better? Is it better to let the dollar weed continue to just take over and just let it do its thing and for sure kill my grass in spots? Or is it better to to hit it and take a little bit of licks right now, take a little bit of dinging, a little bit of whatever that's going to not look so good, but I'll get rid of the weeds and then let the grass recover. Why? Because I'm doing all the other things. I'm fertilizing regularly. I'm keeping it irrigated like I need to. I have proper mowing practices, which are number one all the time. You know, all of those things that are in your control, you're controlling your controllables, it will recover. And in time, the idea is, is that maybe you can keep the dollar weed out with minimal, minimal, minimal spot sprays, right? Just a little bit. Maybe you'll be able to get um, um, a gallon of pre-mixed Roundup for lawns or something and use that on small, small infestations. But what I'm trying to tell you is don't be afraid to ding the lawn. And by the way, Celsius is probably one of the more mild ones. Um, if you have sedges or Kalinga, you could use sedge hammer or we have pro sedge, which is like the generic. I've never seen that do anything to any grass type. I've never seen that stunt any grass type. So that one's fine. But like if you're using blindside, which I've stopped using blindside because blindside actually will ding your St. Augustine pretty hard uh, in the summer. Works great though. I was at a golf course a couple years ago that uh, has a Bermuda grass and they exclusively use blindside in the summer because it just, it just, it's burns down stuff quick whereas Celsius is a little bit slower. But I don't like the dinging that I get from blindside. It's just a little more than I want to deal with. So I use Celsius uh, and I deal with a little bit of stunted growth, maybe a little bit of yellowing here and there. So that's kind of how you got to think about it, Don. I don't want you to be scared of your grass. Let it, let it, let it go through some pain. Let it get dinged a little bit. Let it have to grow back. Let it have to recover. There's nothing wrong with that. You continue on and you control your controllables. And over time, you'll get a, uh, enough confidence and enough experience that, that these things will be reduced. And on top of that, um, hopefully the weeds don't come back because you can continue crowding them out with that thick grass that you have. All right, y'all. So here's another one, kind of a recurring theme, but this one's a little different. And when I say that, this one got a lot of comments in the group. Really good to see. So um, this gentleman, he's got a picture of his lawn and it looks terrible. It It's splotchy dark green, splotchy light green, and a lot of brown all throughout. It does. It looks bad. I understand why he feels terrible about it. So listen to what he says. Now, this is a cool season lawn and he's in uh, Illinois, so for biter. Ugh, I am so frustrated and about to give up. I spent thousands of dollars and probably double that in hours trying to maintain my lawn in accordance with lawn care nut principles the last several years. I have a new Toro, Milo, YMFERT, Biostim, Soil Test, Grass Seed, Dethatch, Yearly Aeration, etc. Not only does the lawn not seem any better this year, it seems worse. It looks nice and green in spring and close to that in fall, but in the summer I can't get rid of the lawn, I can't rid the lawn of the viney creeping bent grass, which allows brown and overtakes the turf type tall fescue. It's more visible after a cut, which is what this picture is. And that's what all the brown stuff is. If you look at this, again, I'll put it on YouTube, but if you look at this, um, it looks bad. There's just brown everywhere. It's not like a big streak or a big spot. There are a couple of those, but it's just brown all throughout where the bent grass has just creeped its way all the way through there. Um, he also says, to make things worse, I constantly fight an infestation of clover and nut sedge from my neighbor's yard. I can't see spending more money and effort just to get something that looks like this. And yes, it looks terrible. So the first thing I want to say, because there's quite a few of you here, your lawn is not going to look in good. As I've said, your lawn, your cool season lawn is not going to look as good in summer as it does in spring and fall. And he alludes to that. But the real problem here is the bent grass. Bent grass is a scourge. I was in Michigan last year and we were seeing it in lawns. And what bent grass is, is it's more of a, I, I don't know everything about it, but it grows, I think it grows with stolons. It creeps across the ground and it lays flat. It's really meant to be mowed really low. Um, and there are bent grass, I guess, greens or fairways and golf. It's not my thing, but it's more of a golf course grass that's maintained really low with real mowers and that kind of stuff. When you get it in a home lawn where you're mowing at three plus inches, like you do cool season grass, three and a half or even four inches, it gets leggy, almost like Bermuda does. That's the problem with Bermuda and Zoysia. So if you mow those at three or four inches and then you go in to try to reset the height and bring it down to like two, you cut into the brown legs because all the grass is on top. All the grass leaf growth is on top in these short little grass leaf area. And in the bottom are these thick brown legs that hold all that up. That's how the growth nature of those grass types is. And same is with this creeping bent grass. So it doesn't look good in a home lawn that's mowed tall. And so all the brown all throughout, apparently that is the creeping bent grass that is showing up. 
And on top of that, again, he's dealing with just summertime. Um, Illinois had some rain, but it's just the lawn is not going to respond that good in the summer. But the real problem here is that bent grass, because that's what he says. It gets worse every single year. Yeah, because the bent grass just takes more and more ground every year. And in the spring, it looks okay um, because it hasn't grown out. It's it's not gotten out of hand, but you get by summer and it has. And so it looks bad. So what do you do? Well, I don't want you to be frustrated here, but what I think is happening here is this gentleman is putting all of his faith in fertilizer and biostimulants and those things, and that those are important. But the real thing is here is you have a pest in the lawn that you need to get rid of. So all the fertilizer in the world isn't going to kill a weed. And in this case, bent grass is a weed. A weed is defined as anything in your lawn that you don't want there. Any green growing plant in your lawn that you don't want there, that's a weed. Okay, it doesn't have to be a broadleaf weed. In this case, it's a grassy weed, and it is the creeping bent grass, and it looks terrible. So you really need to cure that up before you do anything else. So there's a couple choices there. I told him, I said, look, bro, just take a break right now. It's summertime. This is obviously frustrating you. You spend a lot of money. Just take a break. Just enjoy the mow and start thinking about what you're going to do in fall because to, to make a fix or a change in a cool season lawn, the best time to do that is the fall. And my recommendation, because of how bad this is, I would say that looking at this picture, 40% of it is bent grass. If the brown stuff is the cutoff bent grass, which I believe that's what he's saying, and I can actually see a couple lighter patches of the bent grass laying down that's not brown. So I would say at least 40% of this is is uh, is bent grass. And by the way, the bent grass doesn't respond to fertilizer the same either. It's not the same color. That's why you have this light green splotch. A lot of that light green splotch in there is bent grass. This might even be 60% bent grass. It's a lot. So what's happened is that's why it's getting worse every year because bent grass just looks terrible in a lawn. It's just not good lawn grass for a tall cut lawn. So that's why it's got worse every year. And this is why being a lawn detective and learning your land is so important what you really need to do is figure out what are you going to do to eliminate the bent grass before you really do a lot of other things. Now, there's two ways to do that. My way, as bad as this looks right now at 50, 60% bent grass or whatever it is, even 40%, I would choose to burn this down with glyphosate in the fall and reseed. And then going forward, you can use mesotrione, which is tenacity or there's generic now. You can use that. It will kill bent grass in Kentucky bluegrass. And by burning everything down, though, with glyphosate, you're going to just start over. You're going to get a nice, fresh bed of fresh grass, and then the bent grass is going to come back. You're always going to have a problem with bent grass. If you have bent grass in your lawn now, you're always going to have it. It's like the wild Bermuda of the north is the way I would say it. Down here, we have St. Augustine grass. Wild Bermuda invades, except we don't have anything to kill it with. Up there in the, in the Midwest and places like that, bent grass, creeping bent grass, is like that wild Bermuda. And so what you want to do is you want to kill that first and foremost. I wouldn't be doing anything else. I'd just be killing that. So you can kill it with mesotrione. So burn the lawn down in the fall, reseed, and then as you go forward, when small patches of bent grass show up, you hit them with the mesotrione right away. So it's a small amount of chemical. Now, there's another way to do it, and this John Perry had commented on this, and what his advice was to start using the meso now and kill off the bent grass now in the existing lawn and then continue to work with the existing lawn. He didn't go into this in detail, but maybe do an aeration overseed in the fall or something like that, right? So that's kind of your two choices. For me, that being that this is like 50% or more bent grass, I don't, I, just, I, I think once you kill it off with meso, you're not going to have a lot left anyway. So I would rather just kill the whole thing off and start over. That's the key here. If you have a bent grass problem, it's only going to get worse, and you are going to have to use a chemical to control it. This poor gentleman has not done that. He has not alluded to the fact that he's done anything to spray the bent grass. He's just let it do its thing. And so that's allowed him to get to this point of frustration. So if you're somebody that's sitting there and you're looking at a lawn that has bent grass patches right now, dig them out, get the meso, mesotrione and kill them. It takes a few apps. Get glyphosate and kill the spots, reseed the spots, whatever you want to do. Get on top of it now before you get to the point where this guy is, where he's like super frustrated because it's taken over 50 to 60% of his lawn. So this is just like that thinking through the strategy, right? It's not always about, well, I'm 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 doing all these other things, but sometimes there are problems that you gotta stop and take care of right away. Another idea would be like if you're trying to work on a lawn that is super shaded with trees. Well, you can use all the right ferts, all the biostimulants you want. Or I guess another one I see is people have trees, but they also have dogs. I guess we should talk about dogs, right? 
and managing the dog because this would be the same thing. I've seen people, they'll post a picture of their lawn and, the, and they got two dogs back there and the entire lawn is trampled and brown. And they're like, well, what do I do? Well, we, we, we don't need biostimulants to cure the fact that grass won't grow on a playground, right? In that case, what you have to do and what I've been doing with my dog is I manage him. I manage where he goes. So, for example, my backyard's 1,000 square feet, and I let the dog run back there. But so far, he has not really harmed the grass at all. He's peed in a couple spots, kills him, kills a couple spots here and there. But as far as playtime goes, we do play back there, but it's controlled. I control the amount of time that we're back there. And what I do for mostly playtime is I take him to the dog park. What am I doing? I'm managing my dog while I'm managing my grass. If I just let him out back, shut the door, see you later, bro, take over the backyard, yeah, he's going to trample it to death. So instead, what do I have to do? Because I want to have a nice lawn and back there. I don't, and by the way, I have a retriever. He's retriever Sharpe, and he loves to get zoomies, and he loves to retrieve, and he loves to, he's a runner, and he has giant paws. So he'll kill the grass if I let him have free reign of it, so I just don't let him have free reign of it. As far as what the pee goes, we manage that too. I don't just allow him to always go back there and pee. Now, there are times when it happens, but for the most part, I manage that. I put him on a leash, I take him out front, and I take him across the street, and I let him pee on the neighbor's bushes. And now he's learned that when we get the leash and we go out this way and we walk this certain direction, oh, you're gonna, I'm going to pee over here. And he does. He does it on command. Or I'll have him pee like before we go for a ride in the truck. He knows he always has to take a pee before we go on the ride in the truck. Well, that doesn't happen in the backyard. I control where that happens too. I take him on a walk in the morning, and that's when most of the pee comes out, right, because he's been holding it all day. Well, that gets peed out in, in everywhere around the neighborhood. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not in my yard. So these are the things that you have to think about. All the biostimulants and fertilizer in the world are not going to help if you have dogs trampling your lawn. And in the case of one I saw today, there was also a tree. So you had double. The two natural enemies to lawns are trees and dogs. Those are like the lawn's natural enemies. If you have both of those, just you're not going to grow a lawn. So you have to decide. Before I decide to waste money on biostimulants and fert because I have two dogs and a tree in my backyard, maybe I should cut the tree down and manage the dogs a little differently. Now, again, that's easy for me to say. Not everybody can do that. You Some of you are gone. You work all day. I understand. I'm just trying to give you ways to think through a strategy, to work through it, so that you can have a nice lawn instead of just saying, well, I have dogs. I, I have a terrible lawn, right? Or, or what grass seed can I plant that can handle dogs? There isn't one. It doesn't happen, right? So you got to manage things differently. You have to manage the relationship with your dog and with your lawn together and sometimes you got to keep them separated just like you do your siblings right at thanksgiving dinner you don't let them get together because you know it's going to cause a problem well the same could be with the dog and the lawn now there are times when they can get together but it's managed it's watched <laughs> you guys know all right so think of things that way look at things in that context and hopefully that'll help you when you have these problems that seem insurmountable. It's just a, you got to manage the lawn differently. You have to approach it in a different way based on your specific circumstances, whether it's bent grass that's eventually going to take over your whole lawn. So before you fertilize and biostim, you work on killing off the bent grass or you burn down and start over or with trees and shade and dogs before you try to keep seeding your lawn every year with the newest foot traffic grass that they claim is going to handle shade, foot traffic, and no water and everything else. Maybe before falling for that, you just manage where the dogs are, where the dogs walk and where they pee. So again, I'm just trying to get you guys to look at things a little differently, and hopefully that'll help in your success. Okay, this next topic came in. This is, again, from the Facebook group. I found this one extremely interesting, and I, answer, I answered it in the Facebook group, and then I wanted to talk about it a little bit more here, maybe expound on it some, because I think it's a really interesting, interesting topic. So let me pull this up, and let's go through it. Okay, this one comes from Tom, and he says, I have 100,000 square feet by way of five softball outfields. So Tom is taking care of softball fields. Awesome. And by the way, he put some pictures here. I'll show them. They look great. Great job. I mean, they look really good. So, I mean, that's pretty cool. But here's what he says. I'm looking for the best way to get fertilize them, fertilizer on them on a budget. We are a city league and make money by selling food at concessions. The season is over and it's time for me to work the fields. We have some money, but not the thousands I think it would take. What's the best product that's stretched the furthest? I'm in Southeast Iowa, Kentucky Bluegrass Fescue and Rye, Turf Mix. 
I plan on core aerating this fall, and I'd like something that will bind and stay in the dirt for spring. I've thought about straight urea 4600, but I don't think it's meant to be other than just for quick usage. I'll take all the advice you can give. All right, this is a great question. So what he's got, and, and this would be, he's on he's in on baseball fields, but there are those of you that reach out to me often and you say, I have two, three acres, man. I can't afford to be throwing down nitrogen all, all every month and all this. Totally get it. Big lawn, big budget. I take care of the Freedom Factory, same thing. Now I'm able to use broken bags for that, um, but there have been times when we haven't had enough broken bags because Brett and those guys do really well in, the where, well in the warehouse, so I've had to source fertilizer from us, which costs us, costs yard mastery money when I do that. So I'm conscious about that, but I want to think about it. The, the big thing I want to look at here is he's talking about, you know, um, what's the best product that I can stretch the furthest. So in other words, he's saying, what can I put down that will slow release over a long period of time? And I would say, instead of looking at that, look at total amount of nitrogen that you need for the year and then pick your spots because you're you're not going to do six applications a year out there because of cost. You're probably going to do far less. So go ahead and target your nitrogen to the lawn when it's going to do the best for you visually. But before you even do that, find out how much nitrogen do I even need to keep the lawn healthy? And when I say nitrogen, guys, nitrogen drives the bus. That's what's going to make the lawn green. All the other stuff is great. But in this case, these are softball fields. He wants them to be green. You're going to get some other stuff with the FERT, but really nitrogen is the thing you think about. So I'm looking at Purdue University. We've gone through this before. What does it take? How much total nitrogen annually does a cool season lawn need? And it says here on Purdue's website, for moderate maintenance appearance, a dense green lawn is desired, but some seasonal color changes are, are tolerable. And that's what I think we're dealing with here. He wants it to be green at certain times of the year, especially in the season when the softball is being played, right? Because that's when they look the best. And he could tolerate it not being so green in other times of the year. So how much total nitrogen does a lawn need in order to, to be moderate in maintenance? And a dense green lawn is desired, but some seasonal color changes are tolerant. Purdue says two to four pounds of nitrogen yearly. That's what they say. So let's use three. Let's go in the middle and say, that we're going to put down on this particular lawn that we're talking about here, we're going to put down three pounds of nitrogen for the year on this 100,000 square feet. Now, we're not going to talk about cost yet. What we're just going to talk about is the nitrogen. So there are coated products that you can get that will extend your nitrogen longer. So let's talk about that. So in most cases, when you're talking about saving money and you're talking about having a green lawn, you're going to use urea. That's going to be your nitrogen source. It's fairly inexpensive, but it can also be coated with polymers that release the urea over time. And there's a lot of cool technology that's with these polymers that they use that breaks down and it lets the nitrogen flow out. And I have actually seen some, when I worked for True Green, there was a company, I can't remember what they were called, but they tried to sell us fertilizer for commercial properties that was one app a year. You'd put it down in like March and it would last all the way until like September, slow releasing from the one application. Now, I didn't use that, or we didn't use that often. Uh, I don't even know if we used it ever. Uh, and that's because when something is in the lawn for that long, man, it's got a real chance of washing out. But the other thing is, how much nitrogen can you actually pack in there? And that's what I wanted to say. If you got three pounds of total nitrogen a year, let's say you spread that out over four applications of three quarters pound of nitrogen each time. So three quarter times four, right? Three quarter times four is three. 0.75, make sure my math is right. Points, I'm sure it is because I did notes on this, but let's just triple, quadruple check because I'm known to make math errors. 0.75 times four equals three. Yeah, so if I've got three pounds of nitrogen a year, according to Purdue, that's how I want to keep my grass as green as possible without killing my budget. I'll use three pounds of nitrogen a year. By the way, you could, according to Purdue, use a max of five pounds of nitrogen a year. If you have the highest maintenance lawn appearance, the darkest green color and densest turf is desired, you could use five pounds of nitrogen a year. But three, I think, is very much acceptable for a softball field to keep it looking good during the end season and then, you know, get a little bit there during the outer season. So it's logical to divide the three pounds up into four applications. Now, each one would be three quarter pound or 0.75 pounds of nitrogen. In most cases, any fertilizer you buy is going to have some polymer coated urea in there. 
some slow release. In the case of flagship, which I use, 2406, you put it down at three pounds per thousand, three times 24 is almost 0.75. It is a three quarter pound of nitrogen application rate. That's what I built flagship for. 50% of the urea is polymer coated. The polymer coating extends the release of the nitrogen up to 45 days. So instead of it all releasing over a few days or a week or two, it releases all in 45 days because that polymer slows things down. As water and heat and friction hit the polymer, it starts to break down and more of that nitrogen inside there is released up to 45 days. If you were to try to extend that, say six months, you could. They make polymer coatings that will extend that urea for six months. The problem is you don't have that much there. You've only got three quarter pounds of nitrogen, even if 100% of it was polycoated for a six month release, you're only releasing three quarter pounds of nitrogen out over the six months, you're going to starve the turf. It's not enough. So while it's great that we have technology that allows for slow release, it's not the be all end all because you still need the total to match up, you still need the three pounds total. That's why I said do four apps, I would recommend flagship, but obviously something like this, Go to your local site one and see what you can find. You're going to find polymer coated there cheaper. Um, and I would consider this a commercial setting. For you guys in residential, yeah, I want you to use my products. But for big stuff like this, I mean, just go to your local co-op, go somewhere local and get some stuff in bulk. But get something that's got a 45-day release curve on it. Do four apps a year at 0.75 pounds. And then pick your best spots. I don't know when the softball season starts. I think it just ended now, so this is July so you, you, I mean, maybe it starts in the spring. So I would do maybe like three of my apps, uh, one before, just before the season starts, one right as the season starts, and then one during the middle of the season. And then I do my last one, like he's thinking, maybe in the fall. That'd be my four that I would do. And I would, I would use a combination of, of immediate release and slow release. And I would try to get a balance of color, knowing that I really want the color to be peak, in the times when softball is being played. I would also want my color to be peak when the weather's working for me. Now, it just ended in July, so it sounds like the season's pretty good because it sounds like most of it's probably during May and June, which is still good months for cool season lawns especially. So that's when I would concentrate most of my nitrogen in there. That's also when it's going to be getting the most foot traffic, so it's going to need that nitrogen to help grow out. That's also, you know, at least in, in May and June or May, you're getting rain, rain help, cloud cover help, right? Things that are going to be more mild on the turf. So go ahead and maximize it at that time as well and use that nitrogen to help the lawn then. So what I'm trying to say is I understand the idea to look for something that will be slow release over time, but you still got to kind of look at that total amount and then set your strategy based on that and then let your budget be like the second or third thing that you look at after you decide what your minimal requirements are, what you're willing to live with, what you're willing to not live with, what your timing is based on the on, on the weather normally and based on the softball games and all in the season and the schedule. Try to pick your spots. Get that three pounds down as logically as possible over those four apps. So just something to think about, something to kind of kind of look at and, and take into account when you have a bigger lawn, how to like pick your spots to get your nitrogen to maximize the most for you. All right, here's another fun one, and this is going back to why I've said in, in the past that I will never put my name on grass seed. A lot of people try to call me out on that because I sell grass seed, and I do. I sell other people's grass seed that I know is good quality, but I will never put my name on it, and that is because people tend to blame the seed company when they have problems in their lawn the following year, whether it dies out or it gets weeds in it, or in this case, uh, we have three-year-old Kentucky bluegrass sod never been seeded or overseeded with anything but 100% Kentucky bluegrass seed. I'm assuming this is a fescue of some kind, but where did it come from and how is it suddenly spreading so rapidly? Am I wrong? And this is something other than fescue. So what we have is a picture of his Kentucky bluegrass lawn and you can see some wide bladed grass coming in. It looks like clumping tall fescue to me. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And some of the, the questions that people are saying is they're saying, no, it's fescue and it's in some Kentucky bluegrass mixes. Here's another one. Um, let's see. It's highly unlikely you got pure Kentucky bluegrass sod. Most is a combo of three main types. Um, I don't know. People are blaming the seed. 
Yeah, I hear you. That 0.03% other weed seeds disclaimer on the bag can be anything, someone says. So it it's like people are jumping to the conclusion that it's the fault of the seed or sod or whatever. But y'all, these things, you know, there are things that are kind of in your soil naturally. Like it's not like your house is the first thing that was ever on that spot for the last 750 million years. <laughs> or however old it is, even if your area is only 100 years. It was just created. God created your state 100 years ago, right? <laughs> There's still all kinds of stuff that's there. So the first thing you do when you see a foreign grass in your lawn and you know that you've planted 100% pure, clean Kentucky bluegrass seed or sod or whatever, is you go, well, let me go look at my neighbors and see if they have it because they didn't use the same seed I did. So you go over and you find it in your neighbor's. You're like, well, I guess I can't blame the seed now, right? Because I found it in my neighbor's lawn. But see, no one tells this guy that. They all just want to blame the seed company. And I'm not defending seed companies. I don't care. Um, but this, again, this is why I've learned years ago not to put my name on seed because you get blamed for everything. But there are a lot of things in your soil. And I'm not sure. Let's see if I can see where this guy lives, if it'll tell me. Yeah, he is in the Northeast. And so in the Northeast, we have had unseasonable heavy rain. I've been talking about, it's kind of a recurring theme in this podcast that what happens when you get this unseasonably heavy rain in an area that you're not used to it, like in cool season, New England in the summer, you're used to getting a little bit of rain here and there. And now you have heavy rains that are day after day after day. Well, what that does is that water soaks deeper and deeper and deeper, and it stays wetter deeper. And that can wake up seeds that have been hibernating under there for years. So just so you all know, we talked about glyphosate not killing seeds. I talked about that in the podcast too. But the other thing to know is that seeds from weeds or weedy grasses or whatever, they can stay in the soil for years. They get buried too deep. The conditions aren't right for them to, to germinate. So they just stay dormant in the soil for years and years and years. And now all of a sudden you have a heavy, wet year in New England and boom, the, the seeds from this, this clumping tall fescue that have probably been sitting on there for a long time, they have been stimulated. They have gotten what they needed. They've gotten the moisture they needed, the heat, whatever it is, and boom, here it comes. So don't be first to blame your seed company. Look at what is different about the year. This is with everything in the lawn. Think about the conditions. Nature is always your first consideration when you think about diagnosing a problem in the lawn. What is going on nature-wise, weather-wise? heat-wise, rain-wise. What do I have going on? And in this case, lots of water, lots of rain, soaking deep and waking up those uglies from below. By the way, I'll predict right now, if you live in New England and you didn't get down a crabgrass preventative, or even if you did, you're going to have more crabgrass breakthrough than normal. And that is because with heavy rains and heavy rains being a technical term, I don't know what that means to you or to me, but unseasonably heavy rain can wash out pre-emergent. It's not bulletproof. It doesn't last through everything. It's, meant, it's been tested um, over the years to work in conditions, and it works great in perfect conditions, and it'll even work outside of those. But there are certain times where there's a tipping point where things are going to fail. You know, we, we got this dam in our town, and our town never flooded for 300 years, and then all of a sudden we had a 300-year storm come through and the dam overflowed. Well, I mean, yeah, it happened, right? It happened. The weather won that time. This is what can be happening. You could be having a... Uh, an unseasonably 100 year wet period or something right uh, don't google search 100 year wet period you won't like what you find but that could be what's causing these uglies to come in but don't always blame the seed company All right, y'all, next I'm going to change it up a little bit and talk about robot mowers. You know that's something I'm into lately and uh, just interested in it. I just, I like technology and I like this technology because it's it's around something that I love, which is lawn care. And uh, I actually installed the Luba, which everybody talks about. Been working with that at my house and we'll have a video coming out on that soon. Actually going to shoot some more video for that this afternoon. But I wanted to kind of talk about when do I think that robot mowers will be ready for the mass market. And when I say that right now, uh, it is they are not ready for the mass market of consumers. And when I say that, they're ready for people like me or Brett 
or maybe you listening who likes new technology, you don't mind working through bugs or frustrations or you kind of enjoy it. It's like, in, and I'm not like this in all things, but in the robot mowers I am, I kind of like seeing the challenges that are happening. I like seeing what's wrong and what's right, what needs to be improved because it'll be fun for me to watch these companies improve in real time. I think that's really cool. It's like, it's like development work in real time. It literally is. So I enjoy that part of it. And obviously I see the financial ramifications of where robot mowers are going. I do believe that in the next five years or so, they're going to be on a very large percentage of lawns. So with that, I thought, when will I say that they're ready for the mass market? Because again, they're not now. They're, they're for us that likes to do this kind of stuff and likes to tinker and you like setting up the the network to and the and the mowing patterns and all these things right you like to you like to pull the levers i guess would be the way to say it um and that's why a lot of you like fertilizing too right you like to use different fertilizers liquids granulars you know whatever you like to try different things uh will not fertilize for two months see what happens fertilize heavy for a month see what happens blah 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 you like these things you're pulling the levers you're you're tinkering with it this is the same thing bodybuilders do. What do they do? They tinker with their chemistry, right? They go on cycles, bulk up, lean down, whatever. They, there's people that are hacking their body, I guess is the way. This is something that a lot of people like to do, and I like to do it here with the robot mower. But they're not ready for the mass consumer. The guy or girl that's going to Home Depot today because he just bought a house, doesn't know anything about the lawn, but he knows he needs a, a mower is it ready for him? Heck no, not even close. So when do I think they will be ready for the mass market? And that will be when the robot mower setup installation and usage gets closer to what a current buyer has to go through with buying the mower, setting it up and using it. So what do I mean? So let's picture that brand new homeowner that just got his house a couple weeks ago, has moved in, got to get a mower, him and his wife, they go up to the Lowe's at a Home Depot or the Ace over by there. And they're like, what do I get, right? So their choices are like usually walk behind mowers, maybe a zero turn or two, and then a tractor or two. That's what you're going to find at, at big box stores. And so then they have to start thinking there's the budget that they got to consider. Then there's the size of the lawn, which most people don't think about that. Most people will and again, I'm talking about not you all that are listening. I'm talking about somebody that just doesn't know about lawn care. A 35-year-old person that just bought their first house and never did much as a kid with their dad in the lawn or anything like that, right? They're just they're getting a mower just to get past what they have to get past, which is cutting. So the budget will be a concern. Obviously, yeah, the size of the lawn might, but really there might be features. There might be branding. They know Toro. They know Honda, which is still on some shelves, but I think is getting pulled off. Maybe they want to go with battery instead of gas because that seems convenient, so they go with Ego, right? Those are those are the things that they're going to consider. But whether you're buying an Ego mower or a Toro gas-powered mower, you have to realize the barrier to entry and setup is pretty simple. What do you do? You go to the store, you buy the mower. If you buy the Ego, obviously, you get the battery with it. You take it home. You charge the battery. You got to learn a few things, how to use it. Like you got to hold this button down for a few seconds before pulling this lever. That's how you engage the blade. You know, you got to kind of get used to how does the self-propelled work? You know, how do I raise and lower the deck? These are things that people that have never mowed before don't know. You guys listening are like, well, those are simple things. I promise you, man, to somebody that hasn't mowed a lawn before, that hasn't, that has grown up um, not taking care of lawns, they don't know these things. It can be daunting. So they got to learn them. And then there's also the, there is a little bit of assembly with some. Maybe you got to assemble the bagger a little bit. You got to figure out how your mulch plug goes in. There's little things, right? If you get a zero turn, there's a little bit more uh, to to do. But other than that, it's not too difficult. But it's not over there when you get home. You have to mow the lawn a few times to understand what's the most efficient way to get it done. Most of you now that have mowed your lawn a few times and lived in your house for a while, you kind of have the same patterns that you mow. I know we tell you to change up your mowing patterns, but let's be honest, y'all don't do that. I don't either. Right? I got a 21-inch walk-behind mower. I'm not creating ruts, okay? I'm just not. So you're mowing pretty much the same pattern all the time, unless you're doing stripes. When I lived up north, yeah, I did do it. I did change my patterns based on the angle of the sun so I can get the best stripes. But here in Florida, no, man. Um, and plus, my, my St. Augustine is so thick like a mattress, there ain't no ruts getting built in that. So I may have mentioned this before, but, but what I'm trying to say is there is a little bit of a learning curve with just how to mow comfortably, and then also there's the frequency of it. If you mow, if you're brand new with your house and you let it go for two weeks, you're going to have a really tough experience mowing. 
than if you learn that, oh, well, if I mow every week or I start mowing every week, which is what most people do, if I mow every week, it's going to be easier than if I wait every two weeks. Now, some people never get that message and they just always mow every two weeks and just scalp the crap out of it. And they're the ones that will tell you they hate lawn care. I can't stand it. I don't like being out there. This and this and that. Okay, understood. I'm talking about that person. So there's a little bit of that learning curve for them. And if they're the person that hates mowing the lawn because they do it every two weeks, there's actually some pain there that they're constantly feeling. Like me, when I mow my lawn every third or fourth day, like I do, I don't feel any pain there. Just to mow. I mean, I just mow it. Now, when it's overgrown, I feel some pain, right? I got more clippings to deal with. I might have to double cut. I got more crap that gets in the street. Where the heck do I blow it all? My gosh, where did all these come from? If I haven't edged in a while, St. Augustine grass, you should see how much crap builds up in those edges. And I mean crap, I mean leaf litter material from the grass itself. The stolen's getting thick. And where do you dispose of all that stuff at? You know, you have a thick St. Augustine grass lawn and you don't edge it for a while. Go ahead and edge it. You will have piles of stuff just from your edges in the street. What do you do with all that? So there's some pain, some hassle. But for the person that is mowing every, like me, every five days or so, I don't have any pain. I don't have any hassle with mowing. I just go out and mow. I just enjoy the mow. But the guy that's doing it every two weeks, he's definitely got pain. So he can get some relief from that pain by getting the robot. But what am I getting at? When will the robot mowers be ready for the mass market? They will be ready for the mass market when they are almost as easy or as easy to get set up and get started with as the walk behind mower is. Same homeowner, same 35 year old that just bought his house or bought her house. That's the same person that doesn't know anything about lawns. That's going to either go to Lowe's and buy and, and do the research and stay within budget and buy a walk behind mower and take it home and do the light assembly of it and then learn how to use it. And it'll take them a few weeks to learn how to use it properly. And like I said, get comfortable with it and know the pattern and mow often. It'll take a few weeks not super frustrating, but there it is. And then if they settle into the every two week pattern, then they just deal with the pain for life. Okay. Whenever the robot mower can get to a point where it causes less hassle and less frustration and takes away that pain and it does it in a way that, that is simple to get started with, that's when they'll be ready for the mass market. And they're not there yet. Even the best ones, their apps are terrible. They're in metric. Let me just, let me just give you my, my first pet peeve with robot mower companies. Quit putting metric measurements in your apps when you're selling in America, in the United States of America. Please, all you do is separate yourself from me. All you do is let me know that you are not one of me and you don't understand me. That's what you do. It's like driving a wedge, right? It doesn't work. Use, what are, what are we on? Imperial standard, is that what they call it? Use inches, bro, okay? Don't make me convert. The other thing is when you do things in metrics, so, for example, a lot of these, their top cutting height is like two point, I don't know, hold on. Let me just, let me, I want to get this point correct here. Let me just do something here. Use a little technology just to, to drive this point home. Okay, Google, how many inches is point, no, scratch that, Google, you suck. Hold on. <laughs> okay, Google, how many inches is 70 millimeters Okay, so that is like the top mowing height of, of one of the mowers I'm working with, 70 millimeters, 2.756 inches. That does not equate to anything on a modern mower. Modern mowers go at one inch, maybe two, three, four, five. Maybe there's a 1.5 in there or a 2.5. Maybe there's a 2.75, but not a 2.576 or whatever the heck it is, right? It's not a one-to-one -one translation. So... So the problem isn't in that you just use metrics. The problem is, is that you make your mowers based on the metric system instead of looking at the United States of America where we grow different grass types and going, oh, maybe we should cater to their grass types first and in the process use the imperial standard that they use. Maybe that would be a great way to, to make things easy and convenient for our customers. That's a very, very simple way to get one step closer to getting your robot mower ready for the mass market. Quit using metrics, okay? Now, you can just say, well, you're a selfish American, blah, blah, blah. Well, listen, I'm the one that spent three grand on the thing. Can't I at least read in my own language? You know what I'm saying? So that's one thing. Now, there's a lot of others, you know. I will say that the Luba, and I'll give you a full review on the Luba because we're gonna, I'm going to go into it because it's the first one that I've actually thought to myself, okay, this is something where I'm going to start now looking at cut quality with it. Like the other ones, I haven't looked at cut quality because the frustration is 
is there with everything else just to get it to run every day so that it doesn't destroy itself. I, I had one that imploded. It ran over its own house base, cut all of its wires, <laughs> you know, so, so I got to get through all that. And then I can start looking at the things I care about, which are cut quality, right? Um, the Luma, uh, for example, is pretty easy to set up. It's fairly intuitive, um, but it's got a lot of quirks in its app and it's definitely not there yet, but it's the closest. And I'm in the Luba groups and I can see the people in there are like me. They are willing to deal with a lot of issues because they love the tech. They love tinkering with it. They love changing it up. They love making it better. And that is the thing you can do with these that you have to do with them right now is, and I'm just going to say this right now, if you buy a robot mower, I guarantee you in 90% of the cases, wherever you put the base station to start with will not be where it ends up because you just don't know. It's such a new piece of technology. You're like, well, this is where I think it's logically going to be best because I have a plug over here, but you'll find that doesn't happen. So you're going to have to move your base station. You're going to have to do this and that. We got to get past all that stuff. These things got to get a lot more plug and play. Right now, we've got rid of perimeter wires for the most part. So that was a big barrier to entry. Uh, we've also got rid of, in a lot of cases, the bumble around the lawn feel where the thing just goes around in strange patterns, which is not good for any grass type. Um, Back to the cutting heights, you know, turf type tall fescue at three and a half to four inches, really. I don't, I just don't know if there's any mower that goes that tall. Um, St. Augustine grass, the Luba would not go through my St. Augustine grass. Just wouldn't do it. Four wheel drive, all the four wheel drives is just dig in and my stolens just got wrapped around the wheels. So the tires or whatever you want to say. So I don't know if there's any robot mower ready for my St. Augustine grass. We're going to put it on my neighbors today, which is healthier because I've been treating it, but it's not as thick and I've been mowing it lower from the jump. Um, so we're going to put it over there. But, but basically getting back to this is these companies need to start understanding who their audience isn't right now, but who is their audience? Who's their customer going to be in two or three years and work to get this thing as plug and play as possible. Just like cell phones. I keep going back to that. Used to be when you got a your first cell phone, you had to do things with SIM cards and take them out. I think you may have had to call company, call the company to get it activated. I don't know. There were things you had. To, I don't remember all this, but there were things you had to do when you got a new cell phone. Now, I don't. I don't know. Do they even use? I don't. I don't think I have a SIM card in my iPhone at all. I just all I do is go get a new iPhone, and because I have iCloud or whatever, everything is just there. Like it, it just works. There's really no setup anymore, unless you have custom settings. But those are things that you do on your own. And if you have an iPhone, and this is why iPhones are so great, you don't need a lot of custom settings. They just work really, really well right out of the box. Whereas Android, you know, I'm, I mean, I have Android for a lot of reasons, but yeah, it's not user-friendly. <laughs> Maybe it's because Samsung puts a lot of garbage on here, but I mean, my Android phone, I, it doesn't even unlock. Like I have to always put in the password. It never recognizes my face. Now I've gained a lot of weight back, but the <laughs> the iPhone, it still recognizes my fat face. So anyway, just one of my little thoughts there that whenever the robotic mowers get to the place where they are more plug and play and they don't cause, and they're, and they're the same hassle or same setup as the way it currently takes to mow a lawn, that's when they're going to be ready for the mass market. And we are not there yet, not even close. However, I think the Luba, from what I my experience is, the Luba is the closest. Still way far off, but it is the closest, and you can mark that down as I say it today. All right, y'all. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this podcast here as we are ready to wrap up July 18, 19, 2021 in that range right there. Hopefully, this has been encouraging to you if you've been struggling, and if you're not struggling, hopefully even more encouraging to you that you have dodged the bullet this summer and things are going well. With that, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week. I hope you get to enjoy the mow. And as always, I'll see you in the lawn.